Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to episode 121 of The Team House. I'm David Park, here with my esteemed co-host, Jack Murphy. Uh, tonight we have a very special guest for you. We have uh, Toby Harnden, uh, the author of uh, Bandit Country, Dead Men Risen, and his latest book, First Casualty, about the first uh, CIA team in Afghanistan. Um, but first... A Toby, welcome. Our, a word from our sponsor. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. Now, Great to be here. Now, being a Brit, um, but living in America, do you drink tea or coffee? I drink tea. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a naturalized American citizen since 2009, so dual. So, um, so you still still keep my British roots. I think most of my kind of behaviors are American, uh, but tea is one of the British things uh, I keep. And, you know, uh, probably four or five, uh, not cups of tea, mugs of tea. Uh, a day, I think. Mugs. Obviously not a patriot. <laughs> Hippies and communists. <laughs> well, guys, I just want to take a moment to tell you about the sponsor of tonight's show. Uh, this is Pale Horse Coffee. They are a company that was started in 2019. They're veteran-owned and operated. Uh, have a coffee rotisserie, uh, roastery I'm sorry, in Chesapeake, Virginia. The two owners, Don and Gray, have over 50 years of combined service to our country in the Navy and Air Force, which is where they discovered their passion for great coffees. And they hope to share their love of country and caffeine with you and your family. I have been drinking Pale Horse for the last week, and I've really enjoyed it. Um, so I hope you guys will go and check it out. They offer subscriptions and VIP subscriptions, and they are opening their second coffee shop in December. And you can use the promo code. It's Team 10, right? Team 10. And uh, at checkout, when you go to Pale Horse Coffee, and you'll get 10% off your first order. So thank you, Pale Horse, for supporting the show. And um, hope you guys will enjoy some of their coffee. Hey, if you don't drink good coffee created by veterans, then the terrorists win. <laughs> so, Toby, thanks again for, for joining us tonight. Um, Thank you. The first question that we generally ask our guests is, what is your origin story? You know, what got you into writing in the first place? What was your childhood like? Did you see this path for you? Uh, no, I didn't see it. Uh, I grew up in the UK. Obviously, you can kind of tell from the, from the accent. Uh, my dad was in the Navy. Uh, I ended up being the fourth generation military. His father was in the army. Uh, my great grandfather was in the army. In fact, two of my great grandfathers were in the army. And so I always thought I would serve. Uh, and I was always, you know, I guess, you know, you always want to, you know, little boy wants to emulate his father and, you know, and all that. So that, that sort of led me to the Navy. So we moved around a fair bit. He, I mean, he left the Navy in his late twenties and became an architect. We ended up in Manchester, Northwest of England. Uh, not very close to the sea. Um, but, you know, I just had this, I do remember this sort of distinct, uh, like, desire, you know, to just get out of the place. It seemed uh -huh. very insular and to just get away and uh, join the Navy and and see the world and never return to Manchester again. And kind of that's what I did. I got us I got us um, a place at the equivalent of the Naval Academy uh, in the UK, Dartmouth. Um, when I actually, when I, I got a, a place when I was 16, uh, which is the time around the time of the Falklands war. So I was seeing ships being sunk, you know, as I was sort of doing these interviews, uh, then got a cadetship to college to Oxford university. I did a year at the Naval Academy and, um, sort of basic training before going to university, which made university a lot more enjoyable. I can tell you, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually a serving naval officer at university. I never wore a uniform and I was as scruffy and kind of lazy and rebellious as, as the next person. But in the vacations, I'd sort of scrub myself up and, you know, get my hair cut and uh, join a ship. Uh, and then after, you know, I was pretty, you know, I was pretty ambivalent about it. I didn't really see it as a long term thing, although I had sort of, you know, flashes of enthusiasm sort of along the way. But you know, I went back back into the Navy sort of full time spent six and a half years. But you know, at sea and shore bases in Scotland, and I worked for an admiral 
in the uh, you know in the Ministry of Defence, which is in some ways a disillusioning experience. Um, but the problem for me with that whole period was, you know, it was after the Falklands War, which was a big war for the for the Brits. Um, there was the Gulf War in the in you know ninety one. You know, I joined the Navy in eighty five, left in ninety four. Um, they managed to uh, win the Gulf War without me. I mean, I I actually agitated to to get there, and I guess the opposite of a draft dodger. I, I you know I wrote letters and pissed people off by saying you know you need to sort of just gap my post here in Scotland and and send me, right. which uh, my my <laughs> my boss didn't particularly like. Um, and so you know I sort of I'd always enjoyed writing. I'd uh, you know, I lived in, I had a flat in Scotland and I ended up doing some theatre reviews for the Scotsman newspaper. I was kind of moonlighting. Uh, I wrote some obituaries of admirals for the Independent while I was still serving. Um, and I just decided, you know, I needed to get out. I needed to, in a way, sort of satisfy some of the urges which hadn't been satisfied uh, in the Navy. And, um, you know, and part of that, I guess, was sort of, conflict and and combat and war and that's the way it worked out because very early on uh as a journalist i got sent to northern ireland which i mean i think one of the reasons why i was sent there was because the newspaper the telegraph felt that the conflict was over uh, it wasn't and but i was the i was the guy on the ground i was the northern ireland correspondent and it turned into you know one of the biggest stories in the world and for me it was this sort of perfect combination of sort of politics terrorism, military, and the sort of interplay between those things, which was, you know, for a, for a journalist starting out was, was fantastic. Yeah. And, and how long were you writing as a journalist before you decided to write? Because your first book, Bandit Lands, was about that conflict or about a part of that conflict. So I left the Navy in 94, spent probably, you know, two years in London and sort of finding my way and just establishing myself, you know, getting it's getting a job on the paper and sort of covering crime and, and, and all sorts of stuff, Every, everything from like the Royal family to, you know, goodness knows what in, you know, in, in London. Um, and so by the time I got to Northern Ireland, it was, it was 96 and I spent three and a half years there. And I just immersed myself in this place. It was a very small patch of land. If something went bang, you know, I could be on the scene tops an hour and a half. And often, often I would just, I would hear it in Belfast, uh, you know, South Belfast where I lived and I'd be in West Belfast in sort of 10 minutes. And I, um, you know, I, I kind of went in with this idea that I was just going to go to everything and meet everybody and see everything. And I was, you know, some of my competitors were kind of lazy, you know, they've been doing it for a while. They were taking stuff off the radio, uh, you know, literally phoning it in. And so, uh, you know, I was able to just, you know, by going to places, every single, even if it wasn't really that much worth it for the story, I'd meet somebody or I just have a sense of, of something else. Or I'd just be talking to a local who would, you know, give me sort of a, a sense of maybe a, another story. And so during that three and a half years period, I became fascinated with this, this place called South Armagh, which was the IRA's border heartland. And it was kind of like denied, it was within the United Kingdom, but sort of denied territory to, you know, Her Majesty's government. And mm -hmm. so soldiers, um, you know, the bases were resupplied by helicopters because the roads were unsafe, safe. Policemen couldn't, you know, uh, answer a call uh, about a burglary or, or domestic violence or something without, you know, an army platoon going with them. And it was, it, it was just incredible. And I got to know some uh, British Army officers there and, and, and police who, who worked there, who, you know, were obviously steeped in it as, uh, as well. And I just, you know, I found out that, you know, there's basically six families, you know, running South Armagh IRA. And some of these families, you know, went back, you know, a century or so um, as, you know, IRA families and, and even further back as sort of highwaymen and, and smugglers and, and robbers and what have you. So there was sort of a place apart with, um, you know, sort of uh, so this inbuilt resistance to authority. And I also found that it was sort of all roads led to South Armagh. So, you know, you had an IRA sniper team that was operating there. In fact, it was two sniper teams uh, using a, a Barrett Light 50, 50 caliber rifle. Wow. Um, to kill, you know, kill soldiers 
and police at, at you know sometimes very long ranges and just striking terror. It was kind of a psychological weapon as well. Um, you also had the, the IRA's chief of staff, a guy called Slab Murphy, um, who was a sort of a pig pig farmer and oil smuggler who had a farm that straddled the border. So literally half his property was in the Irish Republic and half was in Northern Ireland. Uh, and you had the, the big bombs um, in England, in London, principally uh, in the 90s, uh, were being mixed and made in South Amar. The operators were planned in South Amar and then the bomb was sort of taken over to England. And so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to read a book about this place and there wasn't a book. And so I thought, well, you know, it, it felt a bit arrogant at the time being so, you know, being an outsider and being so new to journalism. But I thought, it's, you know, there's got to be a book about this place. And and if if there isn't one, then then I'll do it. So that set me on the sort of the book writing track. And was it, I mean, was it dangerous for you? Was it challenging for you being a Brit, like kind of going into these areas um, obviously, did they think you were intelligence, you know, uh, British intelligence? What was that like for you? So it was definitely something I had to contend with. Also, I'd very recently been a member of the armed forces. Right. And I just found something the, online the other day about somebody saying, you know, do you realize he was in the Navy two years before and that he'd be an obvious, you know, British intelligence plant. And it was kind of a fair point. I mean, I wasn't. Um, I think... I used to play that down, not surprisingly. Um, it was the early days of the internet. So, you know, there wasn't too much about me sort of online that, that, that people could, could find. I mean, I just presented myself as who I was. I'm actually Catholic born and went to a school that had lots of Irish Catholics. So I would kind of, you know, s subtly drop that into right, conversation right. if I was talking to Republicans. The other thing is I got some very good advice early on from actually a, a police officer, uh, you know, an RUC, Royal Oster Constabulary Police Officer, he said, never, it's two things, never ever pretend to be something you're not, you know, because that's when you get into trouble. And there were cases of like, like a folk singer or a community worker or, you know, people who just were nervous and were sort of sneaking around a bit and they'd be dragged off and beaten up and in interrogated. So what I would tend to do, I got to know the political representatives. Uh, and if I was going to sort of a Republican rally or an IRA commemoration, then I would sort of be, you know, the opposite of undercover. I would be sort of blindingly obvious. I'd walk up to the Sinn Féin representative, shake his hand, how are you doing, Jim, you know, what's going on? So, so everybody could see me. Right. And then you'd see the people going to ask uh, the, um, the uh, you know, the Sinn Féin guy, who, who is that? So people knew who I was. And then the second bit of advice was never feel safe and always be ready to leave. And so I always did have this sense of, you know, okay, this is going pretty well, you know, I'm feeling good, but just never completely let your guard down because it can turn nasty. I mean, I don't know whether you ever saw, I mean, it was an extreme situation, but, you know, um, a mob killed two British Army corporals in West Belfast in 1988 who drove into a, a funeral, mm -hmm. um, an IRA funeral, and they panicked, it's reversed, and basically the mob descended on them and, and, they, and, you know, they were brutally sort of, you know, dragged off to wasteland and murdered. Now, you know, that's an extreme situation. There's never a likelihood that that was going to happen to me. But I was always ready to leave. And, you know, uh, sometimes I would think, OK, I've, you know, outstayed my welcome here and, you know, time to go. And so the book, when you released it, I mean, it won the uh, Oral Prize for Books, which is a very presti uh, prestigious award. Well, that was the second book. That oh, was the Dead second Men book. Risen. That's Dead Men yeah, Risen. Yeah, yeah. I am so sorry. Yeah, Dead Men Risen. No, not at all. So at what all. What? So, uh, what was the reception for that book? And did that sort of l launch you on, your, on this path of, well, I can write books. I enjoy writing books. Well, it certainly did. So the, re so the, reception, the reception was good. Um, I mean, I, so what I decided to do was to, to basically put everything I possibly could into this book and then leave. And in fact, I left before it was published. And so I wasn't pulling any punches. I wasn't trying to sort of um, stroke any sources. I wasn't trying to gain acceptance in any sort of um, quarter. And, you know, I think that was one of the the strength you know there was there was kind of no there was no holding back in the book um 
And I sort of felt that, well, you know, I'll never be able to go back again. And actually, I don't think that that's the case. I, um, I mean, I did go back a few years ago to South Amar. And I was certainly, it was unpopular amongst some of the IRA guys because I'd named them and I talked about what they'd done. And I mean, <laughs> there was one guy I heard that, you know, he didn't mind me sort of attributing 20 murders to him. But uh, he didn't like me saying he was a womanizer and he cheated on his wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, um, even when I went back there, it was probably about five years ago now, it's such a small place. You know, I, I, I was careful because, you know, um, I wasn't sort of Mr. Popular um, from, from some, some of these guys. And also some of them, uh, you know, were completely unknown. And I either named them or gave so much information about them that, you know, I sort of, brought them out of the, the shadows, which I guess they probably didn't appreciate. But at the same time, I think a lot of them actually either secretly or maybe grudgingly sort of did like it because it recognized the IRA as um, a sort of a competent and is in some ways, you know, very accomplished sort of guerrilla military force that, you know, went toe to toe with the SAS and the British Army at times and was kind of respected uh, by the British Army, um, and that they weren't psychopaths. And I didn't use the word terrorist in the book, sort of in my own words, because I just thought it was sort of an impediment to understanding. I mean, there was a, a song that they used to sing from the area, like the fighting men of Cross McGlen. Cross McGlen was the main town there. And, you know, it was, it was more of a, a sort of a fight, rather than sort of killing civilians and, and what have you, because it was a rural area uh, than it was in, in, in many other places. And, you know, the, the British Army, it became, for the few years left of the Troubles after it was published, it became a kind of a, a manual for people who, um, who went there. And I think it was also, uh, you know, it was a good read for, for people stretching back 20 years that had served in South Armagh and, had, you know, were able to sort of, uh, read about the, the context and and show people like you know this is this is what I had to go through, and for me personally, I you know I loved being a journalist, uh, and there was no way I was going to sort of hang up my boots as a journalist and and just write you know stroke my beard and you know write books at that stage. I, I might kind of be more at that stage now, <laughs> but certainly about around about you know I was about you know thirty. At, 30 when I got to Northern Ireland, early 30s when I left. You know, I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to go to the Middle East. I wanted to see more of the world, but uh, it gave me a real buzz and a feeling of, you know, a book is forever. It's it's history. Um, no matter how good a newspaper, I mean, I wasn't thinking about online then because it wasn't really, you know, particularly relevant, but, you know, newspaper is just like, there's this saying in the UK, it's, fish and chip wrapping the next morning. And I do think it's no matter how good, a pe and, you know, I've done some good journalism, but I feel it's kind of forgotten sometimes even by me because it's just, you know, necessarily kind of ephemeral, but, but a, you know, a book is sort of something that, you know, is never going to go away. So the, this was printed in 99, right? Uh, or published in 99 and you left prior to it being published. So we have about two years Plus, before 9-11, what was your track during that time? So, you know, I've been pretty successful in Northern Ireland from the newspaper's point of view. And, uh, you know, during that period, the story became very political. It was a peace deal, Good Friday Agreement of 1998. So, you know, I was covering um, violence and, um, and, you know, ceasefires breaking down and ceasefires being called. But it was sort of moving in a political direction. And, you know, Tony Blair was there brokering this peace agreement. Bill Clinton was involved. And so I was writing a lot about politics. And although it's not, you know, it's never been my first love, you know, I kind of showed that I could do it and was 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 pretty good at it. And so, um, you know, no good deed unpunished, I guess, in, in where I got sent to Washington. Um, and I, I certainly wasn't complaining, but, you know, I think maybe going to Jerusalem or something would have maybe been a, a better fit for me at, at, at that at that moment. Um, and I remember getting to D.C., you know, in September 99 
And first of all, it was a bit of a shock to the system because, you know, I was a deep specialist in this very, on this, you know, a big story in terms of its prominence in the world. But, you know, it was a very small patch of land. I knew all the players sort of personally, and I was just steeped in it. And I, you know, hadn't been paying attention to, to a whole lot else. And then all of a sudden I get to Washington, D.C. I'm having to write about nuclear treaties and stuff happening in Africa and, and you know, you know, work out what the constitution is and all, all, all this kind of stuff. And um, so, I mean, it was good for me because I, I, you know, I learned a lot and I had to learn very quickly. And, you know, it's, you know, this often happens in journalism. You're sort of learning as you're writing, you know, so you know, you're writing about stuff, you know, almost nothing uh, when you're starting to research it. And then, you know, within a day, day and a half or so, you, you know, you're sort of presenting yourself as a, as a great expert. So, you know, I did all that and I was, you know, I think I sort of started to get the hang of it pretty well. And, um, you know, so I guess I've been there two years and yeah, then 9-11. And so, you know, I guess the sort of war came to me really. And um, that day, uh, you know, for, for everybody, you know, but it, for me, it was like a day, a day like nothing else. You know, I walked into the office in DC just as the first plane hit, you know, thought it was a, a Cessna, mm -hmm. small aircraft. That's what was being reported on TV. I was due, I'd just come back. I'd just flown back the day before. Um, you know, my sister got married at that weekend and I thought about delaying my flight and thank goodness I didn't because a lot of journalists were caught sort of flat-footed that day. And, you know, obviously the uh, all the um, flights were closed down and so there were a lot of people stranded and, you know, there's a couple of people, it was, you know, their careers never quite recovered as there was a guy that was stuck on the QE2 right. come here to start his new job in in New York um but uh yeah so I was there and that that evening you know Humvees and National Guardsmen on the corners of Washington DC streets I knew Barbara Olson a little bit who was the wife of um Ted Olson the Solicitor General she was killed on the on the American Airlines plane that flew into the Pentagon so I, I knew one of the people had been killed and there was this sense of, you know, is the, is the next attack going to be, you know, tomorrow or next week or next month, but it's, it's coming. Um, at the same time, I was pretty eager to get out and get to Afghanistan and, um, you know, go to where the action was. And of course, the newspaper editors quite sensibly said, no, 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 you know, you've got your feet under the table in DC. We need you to cover the Bush administration. So for the next couple of years, that's what I did. So I missed, you know, I missed these early months of Afghanistan. I missed the start of the Iraq war. And I, I had my head in my hands the day the statue, the Saddam statue came down. I was like, I can't believe I've, I've missed this. But of course, you know, spoiler alert, it wasn't over. And um, so I, <laughs> I did get sent, I got sent to Jerusalem at the end of 2003. And then by April 2004, when sort of the wheels came off in Iraq with, you know, um, Sunni, uprising in Ambar and, and Shia stuff happening in Sada City. I pretty much decamped from Jerusalem to Iraq and spent, you know, most of the next couple of years going in and out of Iraq and covering that. So that gets kind of leads to your next book, which is uh, Dead Men Risen. And that's the one that won the Orwell Prize for Books. Yeah. Where you, were you embedded with the Welsh Guard or did you just write about them? So... A lot of this, yeah, a lot of this stuff is connected. So that was a little bit later. So, okay. the, so the Welsh Guards were in Helmand province in 2009. So so after, you know, a year or two of more like two years in Iraq, um, I was getting pretty burnt out. I, I went back to London and I was sort of a London-based foreign co correspondent for a year. Uh, I then met an American, got married, and we moved to, to uh, Washington, D.C., um, I also, in this period in 2005, I was um, uh, I was reporting in Zimbabwe and got arrested uh, with a photographer that I was working with, and uh, we were in jail for two weeks. You know, oh, so wow. and we and we were on we put on trial. Um, we we were acquitted. <laughs> we were the charge was practicing journalism without accreditation, and um, they couldn't read my shorthand. I had lots of pictures of hippos and tigers on my. Um, 
on my camera. We'd uh, pulled out the SD card of Julian's from Julian's camera, and so we were acquitted and deported. So you know that was that was an adventure. Yeah, um, it's a bucket maybe, list thing, right? Being, right? being being thrown in a jail in a third world country is definitely a bucket not list the thing. first guest on the team house who has been thrown into the slammer in Zimbabwe, <laughs> no. right? And uh, <laughs> without going off on too much of a tangent, you know, Julian and I we were we were chained together. Um, sometimes by our ankles, sometimes by our wrists, you know, in the prison. So if one, one of us wanted to go and take a shit, then, you know, both of us had to go. And so, you know, the joke was wearing a bit thin after two weeks. And uh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's when we were released and, and, and deported. But that probably, I think, fed a little bit into a sense of this is, this is getting a bit crazy. And Julian and I, and Julian's a good friend of mine, and, uh, you know, which is a good thing because, you know, we were chained up together. In, in intimate quarters yeah. for a while. How could, <laughs> right, you not, exactly. how could you not be good friends at this point? Right, exactly. <laughs> we both saw ourselves, we both saw each other under pressure as well, you know. Um, you know, we had a lot of conversation about life and and actually he just separated from his wife. And so he was sitting in jail saying, my life is a mess. I was, you know... Uh, just about to turn 40 and was single. And I was like, well, at least you've got a life. I, I don't have anything. So um, I think that probably fed into 2006, getting married, moving to the US and, and sort of back to Washington and uh, back into the politics. But, um, you know, clearly the, the itch for sort of combat zones and, and that ki- kind of story uh, never left me. And, in t- and you know, and I, I wanted to, I wanted to sort of keep doing it. And um, so in 2009, uh, a friend of mine, Rupert Thornlow, who was then the battalion commander of the Welsh Guards, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, um, and he'd been a friend, actually he'd been a key sort of source and influence in bandit country because he'd been in an intelligence liaison job as a as a captain in South Armagh. So, so we spent a lot of time talking about that place and and uh, actually he'd held the job that a guy called captain robert nyrak had held in 1977 when he was abducted by the ira murdered you know body never found bits of teeth and blood and stuff in in the sort of parking lot and um and, and rupert had that job rupert was killed in action on july the 1st 2009 in helmand and uh it was a huge news story in the uk uh you know, obviously it affected me personally. He was the first battalion commander to be killed in action since the Falklands War, Colonel H. Jones of the Parachute Regiment in 1982. Um, That battalion had also lost uh, a platoon commander and a company commander, and and in that order, like platoon commander, company commander, battalion commander. And that was the first time a battalion had lost those three sort of levels of leadership since the Korean War. So I had connections with the regiment, um, you know, partly, th- partly through Rupert, but also other Welsh guards that I met in Northern Ireland. And that actually led me to be sort of embedded with them in Alamara in Iraq uh, in 2004. Uh, and so, you know, I made a few calls and, you know, there were some discussions and, you know, I decided that, you know, th- there was, there was a great story. I didn't know exactly what it was, um, but there was probably a book in this. And so I went out to Helmand uh, for the last month or so of their tour uh, with the aim of writing a book, signed a contract with the Ministry of Defence, which was, you know, didn't didn't particularly end well, uh, but that's what I needed to do to get out, to get out there. And, um, you know, when I got out there, you know, they were still fighting. Um, I was able to go, you know, see them in action and travel around with them and, you know, walk the ground and all that. And also obviously do a lot of interviews about uh, what had happened earlier on in the tour, which was fantastic because it was very recent. So it was before they'd been able to fully process it and sort of compare notes and come up with a sort of, you know, agreed version of events. Right. Um, But, you know, there was, I then, I wrote the book proposal actually after I got back. So there's a bit of a leap of faith involved in this. Um, but then I got a deal and there was one publisher who I didn't sign up with who wanted sort of an almost instant book. And 
I'm really glad I didn't do that because in the year or so afterwards that I spent um, researching, it it kind of changed. So, you know, it was, at the beginning, it was a great story of, you know, daring do and heroism and, you know, men under fire and all that stuff. But, you know, as time went on, I realized it, it was also a story of what happens when you under equip and under man um, uh, in a war and when you also don't have a plan. And so, um, you know, I got managed to get my hands on a lot of documents, including emails and and reports that Rupert himself had written saying like, you know, I just I just need more men to do what you're asking me to do. And by the way, we don't we don't have the equipment we need either. And, you know, tragically, you know, Rupert, who was actually, you know, he was a very courageous guy and he was leading from the front. Um, and but one of the reasons he was was doing that was because the young guardsmen were just scared shitless because they were having to look for IEDs, um, low metal content or no metal content IEDs with metal detectors. So, you know, one of them described it to me as like, you know, walking along a track strewn with IEDs with a golf club, you know, yeah, just prodding the ground. And so yeah. actually the day he died, Rupert was, it was called Operation Barmer. The British always have these weird names, their ops, the computer generated names. So searching for IDs with a metal detector was Op Barmer. And Rupert was doing it himself as a wow. lieutenant colonel Jeez. right out front. That's incredible. Um, yeah, which I, meant that he was, it meant, meant he was riding in the front vehicle, which wasn't properly armored. Uh, it was on Operations Panther's Claw, which he said, you know, was kind of a futile exercise. And so, you know, I mean, it's one of those moments for me where I sort of realized, you know, the best, the best stories in life are true because the moment of his death was sort of everything he'd been sort of arguing about and, and sort of blowing the whistle on, you know, coming together. You know, I, I am going to read this book and we're going to have you back on because I have so many questions now about the Welsh Guards, about these men, about their mission. Um, and I can only imagine the challenges that they faced being a unit that I've never heard of. I, I don't know about you, but but I don't want to spend too much time on that now because we really really want to get up to first casualty. And before we talk about first casualty, I just want to take a moment to remind everyone out there about the second sponsor for tonight's show. Yes. Many of you may not be aware, but today is International Men's Day. Nice. Yes. Nice. It's a celebration of all you men out there and our contribution to human civilization. Thank you for being you. And on that note, we need to talk for a moment about male grooming. This holiday season, I'm giving thanks to our friends at Manscaped. Do I tell my extended family that I have the Performance Package 4.0 from the global leaders in below-the-waist grooming? You just did. Not to mention it includes their lawnmower 4.0 trimmer to tame my bush and score brownie points with the in-laws. Gift your Manscaped or that the sounds man like a fun family, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, seriously. That sounds like a fun family. Gift yourself Manscaped or the man in your life who needs it. Join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with 20% off plus free shipping with the code TEAM20 by going to manscaped.com. Hey, guys, it, you, you want to look good. You want to look good up here. You want to look good down there. You want to look good. Um it's uh, you Inter know, International Men's Day, guys, yeah. and give thanks. Give thanks that, that <laughs> it's not the seventies anymore, and that, <laughs> that that men have a choice in how they look when they drop their drawers. All right, uh, let's, check out Manscaped. Let's, let's, it's good stuff. Let's jump back into the book and our, our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> Do I have to endorse this product? Is that required? Uh, it's if not you play required. your cards right, there might be a free one in it for you. Yeah, it's not required, um, but we both use it. I mean. Okay. I don't know if we don't want you to endorse it if you haven't used it, but who doesn't like a clean? Uh, uh, is well, my a, girlfriend's my girlfriend said that I should not play balls with this uh, with this concept. So <laughs> you know, we'll see. We'll see. Really? So so yeah. she, you know what I say? You try it. See how she feels about it. Then she might it might open her eyes to a whole new world. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the book. Yes. So so how did this come about to begin with? Um, so it's interesting because you know when you talk like this, it, it makes me realize you know how many things are connected. You know so. You know, we talked about the connection between, you know, uh, Rupert Thornlow and, and Bandit Country and Northern Ireland and, and, and Dead Men Risen. Um, and we talked about, you know, 9-11. And so this book was, you know, pub just, just being published 20th anniversary of 9-11. But, you know, the roots of it go back to 9-11. And, you know, my sense of America, you know, being changed and this sort of completely new era. So... I was reporting on everything, you know, in American politics uh, during, you know, those first few months. And, you know, part of that was Mike Spann. And I, you know, I vividly remember, you know, the first American casualty after after 9-11, um, CIA guy. So his affiliation was, um, was made public. Um, and I, you know, vividly remember Shannon Spann, his widow, speaking at Mike's funeral on December the 10th, 2001 at Arlington, very movingly. But then everything sort of moved on. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we were getting into Iraq and, 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 and all the rest of it. And, but a couple of years later, I was in Iraq. Strangely enough, I was at the Hamra Hotel in Baghdad, the sort of journalist hotel. And uh, somebody said to me, you know, did you ever see the, the footage of that CIA guy, you know, running for his life in that dusty fort, northern Afghanistan, um, during that uprising? And, and I hadn't seen it. And I, I watched it. Uh, on YouTube or whatever, and it was David Tyson, who was CIA case officer, Uzbek linguist, and and really, apart from, I guess, Mike Spann, the sort of central figure in the book. And this was Kalajangi, November the 25th, 2001. Mike Spann had just been killed, you know, minutes earlier. David had had to, he'd been in this sort of kill or be killed situation where he had to fight his way out, killed, I don't know, two dozen, three dozen Al-Qaeda, you know, at very close quarters um you know with pistol and rifle and just incredible and then he runs and this was captured by german television running across the court courtyard and then he he bursts into the headquarters building on the northern end of the fort and sort of suddenly bumps into basically a german tv reporter and you know camera crew and various kind of afghans sort of you know milling around in this sort of chaotic situation you can see david's eyes like this talking about the fact, you know, like the thousand yard stare and he's just going through. I mean, I remember looking at him and thinking like, God knows what he's going through. You know, he's, he doesn't know whether he's going to live another five minutes or five hours. He's just seen, he's just killed. God knows how many people he's, you know, that's going to affect him for the rest of his life. He's just seen his, his comrade killed. And so I was, became fascinated by David Tyson. And a few years later, quite a few years later, you know, back in DC, um, it was 2013, um and i remember you know i was covering <laughs> chris christie's re-election in new jersey not not particularly enjoying it i mean he was being a colossal dick basically to me and um some things so, never change right the phone rings it's hey it's david tyson and so i i tracked him down i mean i found out that he was living in vienna virginia very close to to me here um, and an academic at Indiana University who he'd worked with had passed on my email and, uh, and number. Um, and he called me. And um, so we met up in a Panera Bread in Vienna, Virginia, um, and talked. And he was still serving in the agency. Um, so he couldn't really talk, you know, fully and, and freely. But, you know, he was friendly. And I, I, you know, I really got a sense that there was an incredible story to tell and that at some kind of deep level he wanted to tell it mm -hmm. and what you know when the moment was right and so i kept in touch with him um i mean around that period 2013 2014 i thought about you know writing a book about kalajangi the whole battle because it didn't just involve the cia but green berets british special boat service ac 130s 10th mountain division uh, Abdul Rashid Dostan, the warlord, Mullah Fazl of the Taliban. You had all these characters converging on this, uh, you know, this sort of six day battle. John Walker Lynn, the American Taliban. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew it was a great story and I thought about doing it in that period, but it kind of got sidelined for various reasons. But uh, 
I kept in touch with David, although it was tenuous at times. Sometimes I wouldn't hear from him for a year or two. Sure. Um, then at the beginning of 2020, um, he called me up um, and said, hey, I've just retired. <laughs> I'm ready to talk. And, you know, not not particularly religious these days, but I thought there is a God, you know, <laughs> because because I actually I just got a book deal to write the book. But it was kind of that leap of faith where I didn't quite, you know, I, you know, I presented myself honestly as, as who I was and what I wanted to do. But, you know, most of these sources, sources were not in the back. You know, I'd spoken to a couple of people, yeah. but I hadn't spoken to any of the agency guys. Um, and then, you know, it was just the start of COVID as well which uh, weirdly I felt kind of worked for me because people were at home, people were sort of in a reflected, reflective mood, people were sort of clearing out their attics and stuff. And, um, and also most of these guys were not afraid to shake hands and not wear masks and sit around. In fact, they kind of craved it. Right. And David was cert certainly one of those. And so we just talked and, you know, I went from, person to person in team alpha um uh, you know sort of building up credibility and trust with them that you know that i was you know straightforward and transparent i just wanted to tell their story i didn't have an agenda and so i just began to piece it together and you know again the best stories are true i mean i didn't have any idea about how incredibly sort of textured and fascinating you know on a sort of you know, military level, intelligence, but also like on a psychological level. And so it just became just a wonderful thing, you know, great sort of challenge um, and a lot of responsibility because you have to get it right, but right. just a real privilege to be able to kind of dig into this and, and talk to these people. So how, how did that happen though? Because you had this relationship with David Tyson. Did he put you in touch with the rest of Team Alpha? Did you have to go through the agency in order to to for them to bless off on it or did they have to go or how did that all work out it, it was complicated and i didn't know how i was going to do it i didn't have a particular plan um you know i went through a very bruising experience with the ministry of defense over dead men risen where i had to sign a contract to get the embed um which meant that they had to look at the manuscript i had to give them the manuscript and they were you know able to check it for you know operational security and accuracy is what they said but very elastic terms, you know, with with the military, and you know, it ended up with you know 500 suggested changes and lawyers, and actually they had to buy the first print run and pulp it, and we had to reprint it with a few redactions. And I didn't really want to, I didn't want to go through anything like that again. And so, you know, thank God for the First Amendment, you know, is is because you couldn't have that kind of system in in the United States. Um, but no, I didn't, I didn't go to the agency. I mean, I was. I was concerned that they might try and tell people not to speak. Uh, they might have some kind of competing project or some kind of, I don't know, pet author that they were, they were working with. So um, I went, the other thing about it was, is all these guys are individuals. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more so than in most walks of life. So they can certainly say, I spoke to this guy, he seemed okay, but they're not going to speak to me just because, you know, even a close friend, particularly in, sort of in CIA, you know, um, recommends that they're going to make their own decision. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, people don't like, you know, you have to really know someone well to say, you must talk to this guy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went from David, J.R. Seeger, who was the chief the diary speaker, the other case officer on the eight man team that was Team Alpha. Um, he was long retired, sort of writes thrillers now you know in his sort of spare time uh, you know also does contracting and stuff but he was pretty much out there so i went to speak to him I i've been trying to get a jr seeger interview for like two years really so, come on g give me a call jr we're nice <laughs> we're cool here <laughs> yeah he should do it well, i'll tell him i'll tell him yeah he's you know, a, as i he... say they make their own they make their own yeah decisions. sure yeah yeah of course I went to just, Justin Sapp, who's, who was the Green Beret on the team. Was, mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he was the sort of eighth member, 29-year-old Green Beret captain at the time. He's still he's serving still as a colonel, probably retiring fairly soon. Um, he's at the U.S. mission to the U.N. And, you know, he's on LinkedIn. And so I hit him up. And so then I had three. And uh, at that point, you know, I also spoke to Kofa Black, who was the director of the Counterterrorism Center, 
you know, who's kind of the man of the hour on 9-11, the one that sort of pitched the the plan to Bush. Um, Hank Crompton, uh, who was uh, COFA's deputy and was the guy, uh, head of counterterrorism special operations, new unit within CTC, who ran the war day to day. Um, so I did interviews with them. And so I think, you know, I think they knew collectively that I wasn't a dick, that uh, I was trying to do it properly. And I also felt at that point I had enough to be able to write the book. Also, I'd spoken to a ton of Green Berets who are sort of much easier to sort of get hold of and, and, and talk to. Um, and his SBS as well. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd spoken to a couple of them. And so at that point, I did go to the agency because there were some people on, so six surviving members of the team. So Mike Spann obviously was killed on November 25th, 2001. Mark Rausenberger, the medic, was uh, died in the Philippines in 2016. So there were six left. One of them, Andy, is still serving. So he clearly couldn't speak without the agency giving the okay. Um, Scott Spellmeyer, very senior guy who had just retired, um, he wasn't going to speak unless the agency gave him the okay. Uh, Alex Hernandez uh, was uh, the deputy chief, Sergeant Major SF, retired. And um, I mean, actually, when I eventually did get get to speak to him, I mean, we spoke for five hours, but he had the reputation of never saying anything and wasn't mm -hmm. going to talk. And, um, so I went to the agency and said, hey, you know, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. And they were like, yes, we know. <laughs> surprise, surprise. The word had got to them. And they didn't open the vaults. You know, they didn't give me the cables. All my FOIA requests got turned down. I mean, that was a separate sort of department. But they did, um, they did give the okay for serving and former people to speak to me. And they facilitated some of the interviews. So on a couple of the interviews, I had a public affairs um, officer from the agency present, mainly for the comfort of the person that I was uh, was interviewing. And I interviewed Andy, who was still serving. Um, and I, so I interviewed all six surviving members of the team. And so, you know, that was kind of a big surprise to me, but I, I think they felt that, um, I mean, George Tennant and Kova Black have described it as the agency's finest hour. And they much rather talk about you know, the victory over the Taliban in the fall of 2001 than, you know, looking for WMD or connecting the dots before 9-11 or sure. enhanced interrogation techniques. Sure. So maybe that played into it as well. And, well, you know, those are the kind of the Bush buttons that I pushed as well. But it, but it's also, it is a story, it is history, and it is a story that, that deserves to be told. And, and these men need to be, deserve to be recognized. Right. And... You know, for whatever reason that the agency facilitated that, you know, it it reflects well on them just in the sense that they did and they didn't like put the kibosh on it or try to shut it down. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, there's an element of trust in every kind of interaction. And I and so, you know, they never said to me and obviously I wouldn't have done it, but they never said to me, can you send us a manuscript or can you let us know what right. you're doing or don't do this, don't do that. So they were kind of tr trusting me. Um and, uh, you know, I mean, I think it was the right call. I mean, I, I know that, you know, I'm going to be speaking at the agency next month, uh, actually in January, um, about the book. And, you know, I know that it's been very well received sort of in the building, which, it, and certainly from the, from the team and the people associated with the events of 2001, which is, you know, which is gratifying. So, you know, part of my pitch was, this is history. It's 20 years ago. There's very few operational security considerations here, so it's time. Right. And you know, right. I, so I'm glad they. I'm glad they went for it. No, it, it's great. Um, so we, I we were talking earlier, and I told you that like in in most books, in a lot of books, it's it's you know, 300 pages with 50 pages of content, and you know, 250 pages to to justify that content. Um. This is like 300 pages and it's 800 pages of content somehow condensed down and it's, it's dense. And I don't mean that it's dry because it's not dry at all. It is, it, it will, it is compelling reading. And I encourage anybody who is even mildly curious about Afghanistan, the events leading up to Afghanistan, um, because this isn't just when I, when you sent this to me, I thought, and by the cover, it seems like it's just about these men. But 
you, I mean, you were covering things that were going on in the White House. You were covering things that were going on, um, you know, in, in behind closed doors. I, yeah. were you, where you must have done so much research for this book. Yeah, I mean, it was very compressed because we we needed to publish on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Obviously, we didn't know that the wheels were going to come off Afghanistan at almost exactly the same time as well. Although I did have a sense this was coming to an end and both Trump and Biden were promising to you know mm -hmm. withdraw all U.S. troops. Um, but yeah, I mean, I you know, I guess if I have a method of of writing, it's sort of complete immersion where you're sort of you know, every waking hour is um, is reading or talking to somebody or thinking about it and, and putting it together. And I mean, I really believe uh, that, you know, there are great war stories and there are great stories of, um, you know, bravery and, you know, the shit that happens on the ground. But we've had a ton of that over over the last 20 years. And so I didn't want it to be just another sort of bang, bang, book and so i believe that it was very important to capture it's about 9 11 it's about that period in our nation's history and the world's history immediately after those attacks and so i wanted to put the events on the ground in the strategic con context mm -hmm. and so it's not a tick tock of everything that happened in the white house you know throughout this period but certainly you know it starts on 9 11 with david tyson flying from tashkent to london Justin Sapp being underwater on the Special Forces diver course in Key West. Uh, Mike Spann being in the in the building at, at Langley and and his wife Shannon being in the giant grocery store in, in Manassas Park. So it, st it starts on 9-11. And, you know, then it kind of go back. So you go back to the 80s and the and the CIA working with the Mujahideen and then the growth of Al-Qaeda and, and bin Laden Al-Qaeda finding safe haven in Afghanistan. And then the reason why Kofa Black was able to put together this plan, which was the, the CIA operations in the late 90s, or from, from October 99, you had jawbreaker teams uh, going in to the Panjshir Valley to see Ahmed, meet with ah Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was assassinated on September the 9th, 2001, you know, via Tajikistan. But so the, so the agency had a, had a toehold. Um, and, you know, 9-11 was sort of came out of the blue for most people, but we'd had the Millennium Plot, the USS Cole mm -hmm. in, in Yemen. We'd had the East Africa embassy bombings in 1998 and the CIA jumping up and down and saying they are coming here, you know, and uh, they, they will attack America. And so I felt that all that context was, was really important uh, because it kind of anchored the narrative and, and gave a reason i think for the reader to 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 read the book and so you know i want i want a book you know people have got you know limited time people's attention spans are shorter it's a big ask for somebody to say you know read my book because there's, there's, you know i've got piles of unread books and and you know metaphorical sort of you know, virtual piles of other books that I'd like to read, and I, I'm never going to be able to to read them all. So, you know, I wanted to sort of make it operate on on different levels, and also particularly, I think the psychological level of what David Tyson went through, what Shannon Span went through, um, and you know, the cost of the cost of war, and also, you know, this war, well. You know, America has just said this war is over. We are, we've just pulled out. Um, so let's go back to the beginning and look at why we went there. The, the principles of the sort of light footprints and hundreds of Americans operating as, you know, advisors to the indigenous allies by, with and through, you know, going kind of OSS, you know, SOE sort of formula. And it, you know, it, it was a provisional victory, but it kind of worked in 2001 and worked a, better, a lot better than, than people expected. And so I, th I think, you know, there's a real, it's very important to go back and look at that when, you know, a lot of the commentary is kind of, it was doomed from the beginning, it was nation building and stuff. Well, it did become that, but but it wasn't that in 2001. So right. there were so many things to sort of get to. Right. Toby, could you kind of walk us through 
what happened after 9-11 and sort of how the Alpha team kind of jocked up for that mission. I think one of the interesting things I've come across in the past is how uh, short the chain of command was. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like it went from the president to the DCI to right to SAD pretty much and said, hey, make, yeah. it, make it happen. This is your job. Go. Um, could yeah. you kind of tell us about that process and how they got the mission, what that mission was, and sort of getting ready to infill into Afghanistan? And, and along with that, the repercussions with Rumsfeld and Tommy Franks and everything else like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, 9-11, you know, Kofa Black is the, the sort of man of the hour. You know, he he, he um, gave me this description of it was like the Tokyo subway system, you know, and he walked up to the seventh floor of CIA quarters and the sort of, you know, the, the crowd parted and he sort of walked through and, uh, you know, there's this one chair left for him in the director's office. And, you know, everybody was looking to him. And, you know, he'd been running, Counterterrorism Center had been, you know, running these operations in and out of Afghanistan uh, for the previous two years or so. And there was a plan called, the, well, I don't know whether it was a plan, but it was kind of a formula outlined in the thing called the Blue Sky Memo that the Bush administration didn't want to have anything to do with it and neither did the clinton administration but now it was 9 11 everything had changed and so um you know bush uh obviously wanted to go and kick some ass in afghanistan and that was pretty much uh you know a universal feeling in the in the us then i mean bush's popularity ratings that fall were 90 percent uh one member of congress voted against authorizing um military force, the UN was on board, NATO invoked Article 5, you know, it was it was kind of a go. And there was real sense, and I remember this vividly, you know, sense that sort of, we just need to get in there quickly, mm -hmm. you know, we need to stop the next attack, we need to get the people who did this, we need to get bin Laden and expel Al-Qaeda. And the Pentagon didn't have a plan. So Tommy Franks was flat-footed, you know, they you think the Pentagon has a plan for everything, up to and including invading Canada, but apparently not Afghanistan, you know. And so Kofa Black, who was an old Africa division hand, you know, who'd, you know, worked in the Sudan, um, you know, against Carlos the Jackal, Bin Laden had reputedly sort of tried to kill him um, or, or capture him, which probably would have been worse. Um, so he stepped forward and he, you know, he's the guy who said, uh, Mr. President, you know, when we finished, there are going to be flies walking across their eyeballs, which was a phrase he picked up in, in Africa. He also said, you know, I want Bin Laden's head on a pike. I want it on dry ice. You know, he had a sort of sort of flair for the theatrical. And I think also, you know, he was a case officer. He'd worked out what would work with Bush. And this is very much Bush's, you know, character and certainly his sort of mentality in, in that period. And this is this is what he what he wanted what he wanted to hear. He wanted you know, he wanted to plan to, to go into Afghanistan and kill Al Qaeda. And that was what um, Kofa Black was proposing. And so the idea was that very small teams, um, Team Alpha was eight. Some of the other agency teams were, were, were smaller than that, would go in, um, preferably with ODAs, you know, 12 men, operational detachment alphas, Green Berets. Um, but the CIA was not going to wait. For, for the US military, there was, you know, CSAR, combat search and rescue considerations for the military, which the CIA didn't have. Um, and so the CIA went in first. So initially a, a, a jawbreaker team went into the Panjshir Valley, September the 26th, 2001. Gary Schroen, 60 year old, then very, very senior agency guy, um, being Islamabad station chief and senior in Near East division. Um, but in a way, not a fighting unit um and they ended up being kind of stuck in place and it was northern alliance controlled territory and so team alpha was the first team behind enemy lines and so it wasn't a team in existence before 9 11. i mean the core of it the par there were four paramilitaries on the team from special activities division uh, and they were kind of the core of the team um so you had alex hernandez um, who was the former Special Forces Sergeant Major, 49 years old at the time. So he was the, the chief of the paramilitary team. Uh, a guy called Scott Spellmeyer, 
uh, who was uh, a ranger wounded in Battle of Mogadishu in 1993. Um, also paramilitary, you had Andy, who was the guy who's still serving, who former Special Forces reservist. Uh, and you had Mike Spann, a former Marine. So you had those four. But on top of those, you had David Tyson, the case officer, former academic Uzbek speaker, who's based in Tashkent. So actually, he joined at the last minute. There was a former SEAL paramilitary who was taken off the team and put on a on a later team so that David could get in there as a linguist. J.R. Seeger, diary speaker, worked with the Mujahideen in the 80s. So he was an Afghan hand. Um, and then you had Mark Rasenberger, the medic, and and, and Justin Sapp, um, who was chosen by then Colonel John Mulholland, um, uh, who was commanding fifth group and which sort of became the nucleus of Task Force Dagger uh, as a sort of augmentee for the team, partly for liaison, partly because there weren't enough CIA paramilitaries to sort of man all these teams at the time. And one of the incredible things about it was, was, you know, I mean, you'll understand this and a lot of, you know, people watching and listening will as, as well, but these guys, were, not only were they happy to go or they were okay with going, they had a burning desire to go, like send me. Right. And Mike Spann, I think of all the people sort of personified that sort of feeling of, you know, we need to get in there. And Mike, you know, 32 years old, uh, he had a three month old son at the time. He'd recently remarried. Um, he had two daughters, age nine and four from his first marriage. Every reason in the world sort of not to go. Um, but I mean, he, he kind of fought to go, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, Justin Sapp, you know, he, he's, he said to me, it was like, sort of, he felt like he was riding a tsunami and just waiting to wipe out in those early weeks. You know, I mean, Mulholland's ex Delta guy, his reputation was suffered no fools. And, you know, you know, you fuck up and you're out. And in fact, one of the ODAs, you know, that was going to go in before ODA 595, um, Mulholland didn't like the briefing. They didn't. They seemed, you know, worrying about problems a bit too much rather than we'll just work it out. And he was like, "We're done, you know. Next ODA, please." And so, um, you know, Justin, I think Justin was almost, you know, relaxing on the heli on the Black Hawk into Afghanistan because he'd made it. You know, you know, the, for him, the worst thing would be um, getting kicked off the team. Yeah. So you know, these guys were, you know put together in a matter of weeks. Some of them barely knew each other. They flew out to Uzbekistan, Tashkent originally, um, then to K2, Kashi Karnabad, the air base. And, you know, and then there was lots of issues with weather. Rumsfeld was pissed, you know, why the ODAs weren't getting in. There were, you know, Chinooks, you know, nearly crashing into mountains. You know, it was, you know, it was very tense and there's this push. Get in, get in, get in. And um, October 16th, 2001, uh, after a couple of days of delay, Team Alpha flew in on two Black Hawks, and they were the pathfinders for the Green Beret. So ODA 595, the you know famous horse soldiers, Mark Nooch, Bob Pennington, all those guys, they, they came in th uh, three days later. And um, yeah, Alpha linked up with Abdul Rashid Dostum, notorious warlord, and you know went from there. So... You know, there's there's some really interesting things here because, you know, you talk about, you know, the CIA, Cover Black, like them having this plan. And you talk about Rich Blee and, and Tashkent. And yeah. he had had his eye on Afghanistan since 99. And when when um, when David showed up to Afghanistan as a case officer, Blee was like, hey, you're focused on Afghanistan. Something's going to happen there, right? That wasn't Rich Blee. So Rich... That that was a guy called Fred. Okay, he was the Tashkent station lead, uh, okay. station chief. But Rich Blee was the chief of Alex Station. So Rich, who I interviewed for the book, was he was kind of the Cassandra about uh, Al Qaeda coming to America. So he was the head of Alex Station. But yeah, Fred. Fred I nearly said his last name there. He wouldn't thank me. Um, but Fred was the station chief in Tashkent, um, and sort of crusty old guy that was always sort of fighting with headquarters. And yeah, he told David when David uh, arrived in Afghanistan, in Tashkent in, in 1998, you're going to be the Afghan hand, you know, headquarters doesn't, doesn't give a shit. 
they will give a shit one day and and it's your job to be sort of ready for that for that day and and in august of 2001 kofer i mean the the basic presidential daily brief from the cia was al qaeda is going to hit us probably here and they they may they may try to hijack planes yeah yeah I, i'm not sure whether hi- i'd have to check whether hijack planes was on that pdb but certainly um uh, the World Trade Center 1993 group had talked about flying planes into buildings in the U.S. and including CIA headquarters. So the other fear on 9/11 was that a plane was going to, um, you know, hit hit CIA headquarters. But yes, I mean, within you know, it's kind of like concentric circles, like kind of a ripple, you know. But right at the heart, I guess Alex Station and Rich Blee, every single day, you know, they're all sort of you know, waking up with a cold sweat that we were going to be hit. And then ca- Counterterrorism Center, then CIA, then maybe NSC, and then, you know, out to everybody else who just, you know, was completely oblivious or not paying attention. Yeah. And one of the great things in your book, I mean, there's a lot of amazing things, but one of the very reader-friendly things in your book is like the who's who in the very in the very beginning. Because I think for a lot of Americans, we didn't understand the politics in Afghanistan the different warlords, what tribes they represented, things like that. Um, and you have them listed here and who they're interested in because there's, and you go through the, their history too of who betrayed who at which times that, you know, know, right. When they're fighting the Russians, they're concerted until there's a chance to get in under the other guy. And so the CIA had a relationship with a lot of these guys, but, yeah. but one of our primary allies in Afghanistan Part of the Northern Alliance, Massoud, was killed, I, and I remember that, you know, by uh, yeah. by the IED and the camera, um, yeah. just a couple of days before nine eleven. Yeah. So, yeah. So in those in the kind of two three years before nine eleven, CIA you'd had a relationship with Massoud, um, you know, years before in the Mujahideen period, sort of reestablished contact, and we're going in and out of the Panjshir seeing him. He was a Tajik. Uh, he spoke French. He wrote poetry. He had a big library. You know, he loved journalists. Um, and everyone was kind of in awe of him. You know, he was sort of that, the perfect Afghan, you know, for, mm-hmm. for, for the West. Um, and actually David and other, other, well, Fred in the CIA station in Tashkent were actually concerned that there was too much focus on Masood and the Tajiks. And they were sort of agitating to um, start connecting with people like Dostum, um, who was, you know, an ethnic Uzbek. And so this was Tashkent in Uzbekistan. So there was a sort of a, you know, a self-interest in a way because the Uzbek intelligence service had links with, with, with Dostum and it was kind of work that could be done there. But Dostum was the opposite of Masood. You know, he sort of left, left school at 12. You know, he's a brute, you know, blood on his hands certainly didn't write any poetry, sort of drank, you know, kill people, you know, even his sort of closest aides were shit scared of him. And he yeah. wasn't, you know, your sort of Washington DC cocktail party type of person. His wife's bizarre accident. Uh, yes, his wife. <laughs> story, story is, yeah, listen, who amongst us hasn't had their wife cleaning the kitchen uh, and she accidentally knocks over an AK-47 behind the fridge that then falls over and shoots her twice in the chest. I mean, it happens. You know, it it happens. happens. It could it happen. Happens. It does that. That could happen That's to anyone. Happened. That could happen to right. anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it happened to Dawson's first wife. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, so he wasn't, he wasn't an attractive figure to U.S. policymakers and, you know, and even most people in the, in the CIA. And, you know, one of the, things about Dostum is he was this staunch stout Star Wars ally, exactly what the US from the point of view of the CIA and certainly from Team Alpha needed in the fall of 2001. But before then, nobody was interested. And after then, he was persona non grata and in fact was banned from visiting the United States and has never been here um, in the subsequent 20 years. And I interviewed him, went to see him in Shebagan, actually this almost exactly this time last year. I was there and he's like a little sort of, you know, sc- schoolboy, you know, who's all sort of upset that 
you know, the, um, you know, the teachers didn't like him, you know, when he'd been sort of the, you know, the teacher's pet for a, for a, a, a short period. And so the agency, they had some contacts. They had us kind of a, like a toehold in Afghanistan, but it wasn't that much, you know. But, you know, these are entrepreneurial, clever, sort of adaptable people who just want to get in and, and sort stuff out on the ground. And they were empowered to do that after 9-11. And so, yeah, I mean, um, Jack, I mean, the decision making kind of pyramid, you know, which is often kind of like that, it was like this. And so the guys on the ground, I mean, J.R. Seeger is the team alpha chief. I mean, they went in with $3 million in a big pack with, you know, non-sequential $100 bills, completely distorted the Afghan economy because they had right. no change. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, right. Dostum got a million dollars, you know, on landing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was classic. You had to manipulate the tribes, you know, with, you know, weapons and ammunition and supplies, you know, ODAs. Like, so Atta Mohammed Noor, who's a Tajik ally, but also rival of Dostum's, he was really upset, you know, that he hadn't got an ODA, he hadn't got any Americans, he hadn't got the cash. Right. And so, you know, JR had to kind of work that, you know, because the danger that Atta was going to attack Dostum. Um, and in the end, Atta got his ODA. He, he got CIA Team Bravo. And, you know, then he and Dostum were pointing in the same direction, like north to Mazari Sharif. So all that all that had to be worked out. And, you know, I interviewed Hank Crompton about this and, and he was just like, well, you know, there were some, you know, there were some decisions he had to, to make, but usually he was leaving it to the team leaders on the ground. And, um, the same thing happened with the ODAs and, you know, Rumsfeld was upset that, you know, he was upset about a lot of things, but, you know, he became upset that when it looked like success was on the cards, he was upset that, that it was captains, you know, and warrant officers and so team sergeants mm -hmm. that were kind of achieving this victory. So he was like, you know, we need to get some brigadiers in and, and brigadier generals and, you know, two stars in there. Um, and so that led to actually, a, you know, the, the ODC, the battalion commander went in and then you did have a two star seal in Masri Sharif. Soxent was in there, Admiral Calland. Um, and, you know, that's when you kind of see the whole thing starts to change. You know, yep. the big army, the Pentagon, right. you know, USA Inc. starts right. to, you know, want to get in on it. But Build in, those, the in those early weeks... Sorry, say that again. Building up the chow hall and the big bases. Yeah, and... exactly. All that. Yeah, the, the, the big convoys and, yeah, exactly. The lobster in the chow hall eventually. And, um, yeah, the fobs. And, um, but in those early weeks, it was just it was just a bunch of guys. No military kit, no body armor, no helmets. Um, you know, no cool guy gear. Uh, just getting in there and, and doing the business. Yeah. And what's interesting is, you know, you, when you talk, because you mentioned also like the paucity of the of the Special Activities Division, that prior to 9-11, there were senior people in the agency who were trying to get rid of their paramilitary element altogether. And they were down to, I guess, bare bones, right? Yeah. I mean, I think Jim Pavitt, who was the Deputy Director of Operations, so the senior spy, the senior operator, I mean, repute, I haven't interviewed him, but reputedly... Yeah, he had no time for SAD and they were sort of, you know, the poor, you know, the ginger stepchildren or whatever yeah. the phrase was. The redheaded stepchild. Yeah, the, red -headed step yeah, the, ging yeah. the gingers. The, uh, yeah, the bring day their gingers. The daywalkers. Yeah, gingers. The daywalkers. Um, well, and the idea, or at least Kofor's idea, was that the these CIA teams would go in accompanied by an, an ODA but that didn't happen because of the bureaucracy of it all. Even an SF medic who was slotted for a team was the team medic for a CIA team wasn't allowed to go. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Not for Team Alpha. That was another team. But yeah, there was a, I mean, Crump, Hank Crompton told me about this and he's still pissed, you know, that there was a guy, you know, waiting to get on a plane um, and, you know, no go from the Pentagon for some kind of bureaucratic, you know, uh, reason when, you know, you know, we felt. I guess you know his his thinking was, we're all aren't we all on the on the same team? He wants to go. We need a medic. 
I mean, um, even uh, even Tom Greer wrote about it in Kill Bin Laden, how fifth group was restricted to these phase lines, and he wanted more SF guys to come in and help uh, surround Bin Laden's lair and move in and, and kill him. Um, but, you know, Big Army or SF Commander, whoever it was, was like, no, these ODAs can't move past the phase lines, and they were kind of kept on the periphery of the mission. Yeah, it, yeah. It's funny because... Uh, when so the so team alpha had been in afghanistan for a couple days now and rumson was so like he was so irate at this point about the military not doing their thing that he called the desk officer in karshi kanavan and told him like knock it off he said i want him in like fly they're getting on those helicopters they're flying. oh really wow. i don't care what the weather is i don't care what the flying conditions are they're going yeah yeah and i you know it's this Alan Mack, who was um, one of the Chinook pilots who actually Team Alpha flew in uh, on Black Hawks, but there was a Chinook with them in c case the um, air to air refueling from the 130 didn't work. But yeah, he told me about, you know, how, how tense that was. And I mean, he was nearly in a fist fight from one of the other pilots because the pilot turned back because uh, he was, you know, he was uh, flying in and was just going to hit a mountain and then because uh, because all the pilots wanted to get in as well and alan was like you pussy you know you know and don't you realize that means you know the mission's going to be taken away from my mission i'm not going to get my guys in and so there was incredible pressure and um it's astonishing actually that we didn't have a big helicopter crash in that period yeah it it, it it's amazing so uh, I, I there's so much to cover in this but I don't want to go over the entire book, like, but what are some of the significant moments of you, like some of some of the cultural stories are very funny. Like David, like like you said, they had all this money, but it was only hundred dollar bills, and right, and for David, who wasn't a a paramilitary officer, he was a case officer and an and academic. You know, he had a sense of justice, and and I think there was a time when Dostum was. Was it Dostom or what? Atta? I can't remember who it was, but they were going to take a, a goat or a sheep from somebody. Oh, yeah. that So that was Abdul Sattar, okay. who was Dostom's chief bodyguard, who I interviewed um, uh, last year um, and actually was shot in August, but apparently is okay, is still alive and is currently in Uzbekistan. Um, but yeah, he's another brute from central casting. Um, but even he was terrified of, of Dostom. And in fact, he was the bodyguard assigned to Justin Sapp initially because every American had a bodyguard because um, Dostum didn't want any American killed because, right. you know, he learned from Somalia and Beirut that, you know, dead Americans mean, you know, goodbye Americans. Right. And um, Justin was like, you know, I'm just walking around, you know, maybe I'm going to take a shit. I, I, I don't need you to be here. And Satar said, no, you don't realize, you know, Dostum will kill me. He will chop my head off. You know, if you are killed, you know, so um, so Satar was a character um, and, you know, he, uh, you know, reputedly shot, you know, an Afghan who was all the airdrops didn't hit the, you know, hit, didn't hit the target area and they were sort of strewn. So you had supplies strewn across the mountainsides and and, you know, on the other side of rivers and Afghans. You know trying to grab the stuff and this was this was a problem and you know satire just shot one of them in the chest you know yeah um welcome to afghanistan but yeah he was <laughs> they were in the market and um there was a bunch of sheep um and you know satire was trying to kind of strong arm the villager into just giving him the sheep and dave was like no no no, we need to pay for it and so satire just kind of threw a rusty knife at him and said, well, you, you, you kill them then, you know, you slaughter them yourself. And of course, you know, <laughs> David lived in a few far flung places, but you know, didn't especially want to slit the throat of a sheep with a rusty knife. So that became a kind of a running joke. And one of the, one of the things about David is because of his, you know, ling linguistic skills, um, and his sort of immersion in the culture of South Asia, uh, Central Asia, um, you know, he lived in Uzbekistan for years before he joined the agency, you know, when he was a student. And at one point, you know, he didn't possess a pair of shoes, you know, he was that far, you know, towards going native. Um, and so 
he sort of loved the Afghans and just wanted to, you know, he just wanted to soak up everything about them. And humor was a big part of it. And, you know, so there were jokes about, you know, why do Afghans sort of crouch down to take a piss with Americans stand up and why are your American hands so soft? And, right. you know, <laughs> if, you know, if you're so clever, you know, why can't, why don't you even know diary and, you know, and uh, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, there was stuff about religion and uh, alcohol. So, you know, a number of the Afghans, it was one, one Afghan commander initially went to David, sort of knocked on the door of his cave or wherever they were sleeping at that point. And, uh, you know, he said, my, you know, my, ha my hand's shaking, you know, I need, I need medicine. And he used the Uzbek phrase for devil's water. <laughs> and he wanted, he wanted vodka. And um, so David um, ordered vodka. And so there was vodka flown in from Tashkent. And so these Afghan commanders would sort of, you know, come to David one by one, always individually. So they never talk amongst themselves and get a like a little like tot of vodka, you know, for, for purely for medicinal right. purposes. Right. And, um, and then there was, there was a moment when I think David was on the sat phone to uh, Charlie Gilbert, who was by then the Tashkent station chief, uh, ordering uh, another three million dollars, you know, a load of vodka, and Alex was listening in and just joking, says, uh, "Oh, sounds like a pretty good party. Why don't we order some condoms as well?" And I don't know whether David realized, or I think he probably, you know, so he's like, "Yeah, Charlie, we'll have some condoms." And so some condoms got sent in, and um, and the Afghans saw these things and like, what what are these? And you know, pictures of sexy women on the, you know, the packaging. And, and David was like, um, um, okay, so you know, these are to put on the rifles. And then they were looking at the, they were looking at the pictures. And so David says, no, okay, well, all right, you know, you put them on your dick, so. You don't have babies, you know. That's that's what they're for. And these Afghans are just like just couldn't comprehend why anybody would ever want to do that. It just <laughs> right. didn't make any sense. And so, you know, they were trying them on, they were blowing balloons with it, you know, it was sort of chaotic. And in the end, David had to say, you know, this is the middle of fighting a war and everything. And in the end, David had to say, Okay, 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 listen, I'm sorry. I played this stupid trick on you saying this ridiculous thing that, you know, these rubber things are to put on your dick. No, no, no. They, you put them on the end of your rifle to stop the dust and dirt and grime, you know, getting in the rifle barrel. barrel. I'm, I'm sorry I tricked you. But like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> so there's lots of this kind of stuff going on, which, um, I don't know, I found fascinating because, you know, David and, and JR in particular with their languages, you know, just have this real sort of sense of, of the Afghans and their sort of psyche. And, you know, David, um, you know, has a sort of a deep love of Afghans. And I mean, the guy who was killed the same day as Mike Spann was called Aman Amanala, who was Dostum's intelligence chief in the mountains. And, you know, David still, you know, com is close to tears when he, when he talks about him, you know, that, and, you know, the, these Afghan, these brave Afghans and Amanullah had been a Taliban prisoner. Um, he, but he was a very sort of humane guy. And, you know, so, you know, the death of some of these guys um, cut deep. Um, but the other thing about David, which I think gave an, another dimension to this, to the book really into the story was um, that, you know, he could talk about the Afghans and know them better than almost any American could. But he had this sort of moment of realization pretty early on that he talked about the Afghan onion and peeling the layers. And, you know, he'd spent, he knew the languages. He spent many years in the region, but he came to this realization that, you know, it would take him several lifetimes to be able to work out this country and these people, um, which was kind of sobering. And for me, it was sort of, you know, a bit of a, an insight into, you know, in a way how foolish we were to think that we could just go in and transform this country and build a centralized democracy 
when people like David Tyson, who knew more than nearly anybody else, realized he could never understand them properly, right. you know. And so it's it's kind of this case of the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Right. And it's something that Americans don't really grasp. Like we think in terms of a national identity, right? Even even if we hate our country, we still recognize our country. But they don't for the lar- for the most part. They they are tribal. They see themselves yeah. as tribes, and tr- having this idea that we're going to form this this national identity is it, it's a very Western thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, there are a lot of great. You know, I'm a naturalized American. You know, and um, I'm very proud to be an American, and it's a great country, and you know. But some of our best qualities are sort of, you know, optimism and can do and we can fix it and um, we're great and we want to offer what's great about us to everybody. You know, there's a there's a real sort of um, there's a real flip side to that. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, this one of the tragedies of this is that the early success of this period is that the, the success, you know, in the in the fall of 2001, really by the start of December 2001 led us I think to believe that uh this was easy you know Mm. we just change a regime introduce democracy you know we'll let that nice Hamid Karzai sort out the details and let's go on to Iraq and let's go do the next one Mm. and so that's the sort of the the flip side of the of the can-do thing yeah yeah Yeah, I think Wesley Morgan's book on Afghanistan really reflects that as well yeah, that the, that the army had a sort of can-do attitude. Um, that we were always eight months away from winning the war for twenty years. Right. No, I, I mean that's a great book. Um, and you know, yes, the way he, um, you know, connects. You know, he focuses on one place and mm-hmm. connects the history of that place from uh, unit to unit. Really, there should have been an, an army kind of department that was doing that. But, you know, I saw that in Helmand, six, you know, six month brigade tours, reinventing the wheel the whole time. Right. You know, new brigadier comes in, big operation, medal, right, declare right. success, right. this many Taliban killed. And then the, you come in again and, and, and do it. So, yeah, you know, that's, that's, yeah, I remember being in Iraq and being told, this phrase is 2004 irreversible momentum <laughs> you know this irreversible momentum towards victory that was the first <laughs> infantry division in 2004 and even at the time you know there was pretty strong whiff of bullshit about that yeah yeah uh, you know i think like one of the one of the stories that really cuz you know, when you're setting the whole thing up and talking about how these different warlords interacted with each other, whether it was against the Russians and the way they worked together, but then but, but then they betray each other or yeah. whatever. Um, when you're talking, when you talk about uh, uh, Atta, right, and how he won't talk to Jr. and they finally yeah. like works that over, and so they meet. Do you, can you tell that story? Do you remember? Yeah. So. Um... Right, so they 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 arrive, and they meet Dostum, and they know that Atta's in the vicinity, and Atta is on paper an ally, and also wants to go and topple the Taliban. But Atta isn't there, and so Jr. says to Dostum, you know, I need to see Atta, and he's like, oh, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> and so Jr. has to kind of, you know, lobby for an audience with Atta, you know, who's this, you know, big sort of black beard, he like sort of Captain Haddock from Tintin, you know, very kind of dour, sort of more, much more religious than, than Dostum. And, you know, he's seen by the Americans as a subordinate to Dostum, but he doesn't see it that way at all. And he's a Tajik and the Tajiks, uh, you know, sort of in command of the Northern Alliance. So he's talking to Fahim Khan in the Panjshir Valley. And so there's all these kind of, you know, connections. And so JR goes to see him to see Atta eventually, who's very, very nearby. And um, JR wears a Pakol hat, you know, which is like a Tajik thing. And, um, and Atta, um, you know, the first thing he does is he corrects him and tells him he's not wearing the hat 
exactly the right way and he gets one of his aides to you know and jr's just kind of you know rolling his eyes i guess inwardly um and then jr speaks um uh speaks dari um uh but you know uh atta is uh saying that you know he wants to, uh, he wants to speak i can't remember whether it was he wanted to speak in a different language <laughs> Uh, or maybe it was he said that JR's diary wasn't good enough. Right. <laughs> I think he said that JR's diary wasn't good enough. And so therefore, JR had to speak in English to a translator who would translate it into diary and then speak to Atta. But it was a power play. Right. And it also meant that Atta had, and I've, I've encountered this as a journalist, Atta had twice, he, he could understand the question mm -hmm. in the first place, um, but he had twice as long to answer it. And also his translator could, you know, alter, the, you know. So, um, yeah, Atta was pretty, pretty difficult uh, to deal with. And, um, but, you know, JR needed him on board. And so what he did in the end was he, he Team Alpha, I mean, it was only eight of them, but they were, they were regularly broken up. So three of them, David Tyson, Scott Spellmeyer and Andy, went on a 13-hour um, horse ride to Atta's headquarters um, and they were the sort of three-man pathfinder team for uh, ODA 534 and Team Bravo. And um, so then, you know, Atta had his ODA, he had his Americans and, and, and he was okay. But, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, and in subsequent years, Atta and, and, and Dostum have, you know, been fighting against each other. I mean, last year, I went for an interview with Atta, um, what I thought was going to be an interview, and I ended up um, just meeting with one of his sons and two of his aides, who were basically grilling me about who I was, and and I didn't get the interview because I was too closely aligned with Dostum. My focus was too strongly on Dostum, right? And I kind of, you know, I don't know whether I could have pulled it off. But I should have gone in there saying, because I said, listen, I just need you know, two hours of, um, you know, um, Usted Atta's time. And they were like, only two hours, you know, he's, he's has a lifetime of stories. Right. But, right, right. What I should have said is, you know, I need five days with him, you know, and that, so anyway, so the rivalry, you know, the rivalry existed before, you know, I mean, once they captured Masri Sharif, there was a deal they were going together. And then Atta went in before Dustin. Right. You know? So, you know, Afghanistan. And, and money was a big part of it too, right? Like they, they want to know how much other people were making. They wanted that. And that was part of the thing with Atta is he said, oh, I want this money. And, and uh, oh, JR's yeah. like, oh, well, we gave Khan 250000 for yeah, you. Yeah, that's right. So, right. So that was kind of a, you know, Fahim Khan, who the Americans, I mean, Tommy Franks hated him and CIA hated him. Um, because he would, they felt he wouldn't fight, and he just wanted money, um, and so he was getting money from the Americans that were supposed to be going to Atta. But I think Jr. had a hunch, which I think was accurate, that that Fahim Khan was just pocketing it himself. Right. And so, so he, yeah, there's quarter of a million, I think, that Fahim Khan was supposed to have given to Atta, and so Jr. said, "Oh, and of course, it's the two hundred fifty thousand." And Atta just kind of, and then was like, oh, yes, of course. And then presumably he was on the phone to, to Fahim Khan the next day. So, yeah, I mean, it's, this is just the complexity of, of this country. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, fascinating. Um, another interesting, a funny story about Dostum was he presented himself, well, I'm not saying he wasn't like uh, rough around the edges, but he presented himself in a certain way to his troops but can you tell a story about uh, him uh, telling his team that the Americans, that he was sophisticated? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and I think to this day, um, JR doesn't know whether Dawson really thought he was sophisticated or is kind of <laughs> even more of a sort of sophisticated joke or subtle joke. But yeah, so, you know, Dawson, you know, part of his, you know, he's been accused of all sorts of war crimes and it, certainly he's done some bad things and 
you know, you don't get to be a warlord who survives for, you know, three decades in Afghanistan um, by, by having clean hands. But I think part of the way he operated was that he, he kind of gloried in the myth of this kind of savage who would, you know, rip people's heads off and, and you know, throw them off mountains and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, he led by sort of inspiration and he commanded loyalty, but fear was also an element of it. And so there was one day in the Darius Sioux Valley um, before the fall of Masri Sharif where, um, you know, he gave this sort of blood-curdling address to his sort of eve of battle um, address to his troops. And, uh, you know, JR was kind of a little bit taken aback and he actually thought it was, it was like Patton, you know, um, the, the opening scene of the movie, which is actually a sanitized version of the real Patton speech. Um, and I think Dawson had spotted, you know, JR, you know, listening to this and he sort of said to him, you know, listen, you know, I know you think, you know, I am a, an unsophisticated man and I am a savage and, you know, primitive and, um, but, you know, I have to, I have to talk to my men in a certain way uh, to motivate them and get them to fight. And, but actually I am very sophisticated, you know, do you know that um, I once owned two Cadillacs? <laughs> So that was his like measure of the ultimate <laughs> sophistication. And I actually checked it out. He, I, I'm not sure about two. He had certainly owned one Cadillac, an armor plated Cadillac in the 1990s that he'd uh, driven around in. So, you know, I mean, Dostum, you know, a, yeah, I mean, that's one of the most fascinating interviews I've, I've, I've ever sort of done in my life. And, um, you know, Team Alpha and ODA 595 and Mark Nooch and those guys they still love him you know because he was with them he fought and you know his reputation is horrendous but they'll never forget what he did in 2001 and and he is you know i think still uh you know when i interviewed him he was still sort of looking back on those days as as sort of the glory days and was pretty upset with the state department that he'd been sort of cut loose after that <laughs> blackballed yeah but it's interesting yes. <laughs> because he he also i think i believe it was him who you quoted as as saying that oh you know you're going to use me and i'm going to use you and then we'll part ways you know he had he had a realistic view of it at the time yeah i mean i think it's like a lot of people who um you know are sort of warriors but also sort of politicians in the kind of broader sense of the word and that they know how the world works uh -huh. and they know how to sort of manipulate. They know how to, you know, they know how to look at people's self-interest and, and where interests align. And, you know, Dawson's, you know, I don't know. Some people say he can't read and write. I mean, I think he can read, but I don't know how well he can write, but um, he's not an educated guy. Um, but he's clever. You know, he understands the way the world works and it's no accident that that he's survived this long. And so, yeah, I mean, he had a conversation with with David in the Daria Sioux Valley, which was essentially, you know, um, you know, he, he asked David, like, what's going to you know, what's going to happen? You know, are you going to you Americans still going to be with me? And, you know, David was sort of. And for now, up till Masri Sharif, yes, absolutely. After that, I don't know, which was a pretty honest answer. And I think actually Dostum appreciated it, and he was like, "Yeah, that's what I, that's what I thought." And and that's exactly what happened. I mean, once they got to Masri Sharif, um, uh, the even Task Force Dagger was was starting to pull back, and the Green Berets were starting to pull back from Dostum and trying to treat Atta, Dostum, and Mohammed Mohakek, who was the Hazara, as kind of a, a triumvirate of, of equals, which was not the way it had been before. So already there was a, a distancing. And, you know, then there were accusations of, you know, prisoners being shot in the containers and all that. And after that, State Department was like, we're not dealing with this guy. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that made it tough. Um, 
so uh, October 25th. So the, the the infill was October 17th. So we're talking yep. eight days later. The DIA gives a report about a, a, a not favorable report. What what do they basically brief the president? So well, it was a briefing to Rumsfeld. Okay. That um, that Rumsfeld then waved, you know, in front of the president or you know the national security team in the White House, which was basically. You know, uh, you're going to get bogged down in the winter. Uh, in the you know, once the winter sets in, you're not going to capture Mazari Sharif until the next spring. Um, and you know, beware the experience of the Russians. Um, and you know, at the time, there was a sort of a there were a number of articles, Johnny Apple in the New York Times in particular, and and, and playing off him, several others about you know, is this the new Vietnam now? course in a way it did become the new vietnam but but not just yet you know right but there was this kind of um you know along with this sort of push to get in quickly and get results quickly um there was a real impatience about you know well it's you know it's late october and we still haven't won this which right. i think about it mate it's kind of makes no sense we've been here two course, weeks yeah right <laughs> and you know and you know of course it Part of this is that um, Rumsfeld is pissed that the CIA is in control and the CIA got in there first and Tommy Franks didn't have a plan and all this. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's what Rumsfeld is saying and that's what he's passing on to Colonel Mulholland who's, you know, passing on to the ODAs. And so at one point, you know, Mark Nooch wrote um, like a... I guess a cable back um, to Task Force Dagger saying, you know, and, you know, one of his sergeants said, sir, this, this could be the end of your career. In fact, it was the making of his career. Um, basically, sort of laying out, like, you know, you may think we're sitting on our asses doing nothing, but in the meantime, we're riding on horseback into battle. You know, uh, we've killed this many um, Taliban today. We've lost this number of, of people, but, you know, we're winning and, you know, we're, in fact, he used a sort of pattern phrase, you know, we're killing them by the bushel. Yeah. And by the time this gets back, you know, it is becoming more clear that Masri Sharif is going to going to fall. And just after it fell, you know, Paul Wolfowitz, then the deputy um, secretary of defense, um, reads it out, reads that, you know, reads this out at, um, you know, a big Washington gala event at the Ronald Reagan Trade Center building. And and he actually embellishes it and says that, you know, the Green Berets had swords as well. You know, I don't know, you know, not only are they on horseback, but they've got swords. Um, and, um, you know, so yes, so that was actually part of the sort of legend of, of horse soldiers. And they, at the same time, they released pictures of, um, uh, funnily enough, I, I don't think it was ODA 595, it was some... Alex Hernandez from Team Alpha and some of the um, the ODC on horseback, but, you know, Green Berets on horseback. And actually, they weren't riding into battle. They were just kind of riding around on that day. But anyway, there were great pictures and they accompanied um, Nooch's, Nooch's cable. And so, um, but yeah, when the, that DIA report was kind of tabled and then it was brought up again, actually on the eve of the fall of Masary Sharif and um, Hank Crumpton was in, uh, a White House meeting and basically said, Masary Sharif is going to fall in, within the next 24 or 48 hours. And George Tenet, the CIA director, is looking at him thinking, I hope he's right. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he was right. Right, right. It's a zero hero moment, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you talk about Nooch. Um, it's interesting because this is about the same time that now that things are sort of getting sexy, Right now that they're getting attention and things are getting sexy, is when is when it's time for more officers because that's what we need. Right, exactly. It's what any war so, needs. Right, exactly. More officers, more senior officers. Right. So yeah, so you know Mark Nooch, you know, who's actually you know wife was heavily pregnant. Actually gave birth in late, I think late October. Or early November two thousand and one, having to, having to deal with all this, he's he's done the classic 
um, Q course thing with mm -hmm. the G chief. Um, you know, Robin Sage operate, you know, where you, you get close to the G chief, the gorilla chief, make friends with him, stop him from killing you, um, committing war crimes, stealing things, um, and, you know, get him to <laughs> do what you want him to do. Um, and you know, he pulled it off, Mark had pulled it off by all accounts, you know, magnificently well. And, and to this day, mm -hmm. it's kind of a love between these two men, you know, like, like a, a father son type of thing. Um, Mark was a, uh, a great horseman. He'd grown up in Kansas. And so, uh, that was, you know, a, a huge advantage for, for, for Mark because, you know, most of the Green Berets and the CA guys was like falling off the horses and there was lots of jokes and, you know, and it's freaking painful and dangerous and, and these scrawny, you know, stallions that would fight each other. And, you know, it was pretty difficult to, to deal with, but, you know, Mark was an expert horseman. And um, so he built up this relationship with Dostum and, you know, there'd been a little bit of frustration initially because um, the ODA didn't bring in a soft lamb and didn't bring an air force combat controller in mm -hmm. because they felt they could call in the airstrikes mm -hmm. themselves. Uh, triple nickel, the ODA in the Panche actually did have um, an air force air controller with them. Anyway, a couple of the air force guys get flown in. The soft lambs come in with them, and you know, there's a period. It's not easy to coordinate 19th century style cavalry charges with you know the awesome might of u.s air power in the 21st century and so that had to be worked out and kind of coordinated and synchronized and mark had managed to achieve that with dostum and he built up this rapport and this trust you know dostum who'd be very fearful of americans getting killed had actually kind of relented a bit and allowed the Green Berets to go forward because that's what they needed to do to get eyes on the target and call in the airstrikes. So he'd worked out all this stuff, which is, you know, not easy. And then he's told, uh, right, the battalion commander is coming in, you know, the ODC, mm -hmm. Mac, Max Bowser's name is coming in, who was not a beloved figure, um, I think is, is fair to say. <laughs> uh, the same thing happened elsewhere, like ODA 574, uh, a little bit later, a month or so later, but, you know, in, in Tarrant Cote with, with Karzai, they had the ODC coming in on, on top of them. Jason Amarine was the team leader and all of a sudden he's got Lieutenant Colonel and the, you know, the major, you know, the XO coming in and wanting to, wanting to do stuff, wanting to get in on the action. Because that's what and you so, need. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, this shit happens as a journalist as well, you know, um, I mean, I've been in situations, I used to happen to be in Northern Ireland. You know, you're there, you're the person on the ground, it's under control, and then some huge bomb comes off and two of the top correspondents from London fly in to help you, you know? To help. Help. Thanks. Hey, Thanks, stand bro. over there, over in the corner. <laughs> help. And, yeah. you know, the good, you know, you work it out because you have to and, you know, you, hopefully you're all grown-ups and, you know, I later on in my career was in that situation where I was the guy who was flown in to help and you have to respect the local correspondent and all that but yeah it's like you've got all this stuff on your plate and then you have to essentially deal with jockeying by sort of colleagues who are sort of nominally superior to you but actually you know on a day-to-day -day basis no less less than you so yeah so the odc got got brought in now colonel Mulholland's kind of account of this is well rumsfeld was telling me he was going to bring in conventional army brigadier generals or two stars if I didn't do something. So to actually bring in the battalion commander, the ODC, which was actually, you know, kind of part of this, you'll know this more than me, Jack, but, you know, part of the SF doctrine, that wasn't so bad. And it stopped, you know, it stopped, I don't know, 10th Mountain Division brigadier general coming in. So just, you know, that's it. But anyway, um, it was a pretty tense relationship partly because of the personalities um uh but also just i think just because of the situation and then so that was i think it was around november the second when bowers came in then masri sharif fell on november the 10th so like eight days later and then three or four days after that 
they send in Sock Scent, Admiral Calland, Navy Seal, Two Star, and he takes over from Bowers. So, so Dawson, who's been perfectly happy, in fact, kind of overjoyed with the captain, who's the ODA commander, then has to deal with Bowers coming in and saying, no, 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 you have to deal with me and not Captain Mark. And then there's a, an admiral who comes in and says, no, 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 forget Bowers. It's me. It's so, you know, it kind of complicated things. Yeah, the, the ODA is the maneuver element. They are the main effort for this conflict. And uh, as you say, I mean, there's no where in which an ODB is supposed to be or, or, or an AOB, which is not even a doctrinal part of special <laughs> forces. It's supposed to be like interacting with the indigenous force in that manner, unless it's some sort of like staff and command college type stuff that you're doing in a, in a more developed country. It's just bizarre. Well, the, the regimental commander always gets himself involved with, with a squad in, in regiment. Well, this came, this came in um, journalistically as well because the 5th group chain of command would not let the captains talk to journalists either because they wanted the higher-ranking officers to be able to claim credit for what was going on on the ground yeah. from all those ODAs. So the, the actual team leaders were like forbidden because of quote-unquote OPSEC uh, from talking to the press and ta talking to people like you at the time, Toby. Well, and yeah, it, yeah. It's also well. There's a book. So there's a book called Weapon of Choice, which is a very good book. It's a use of SOC U.S. Army Special Operations Command. I remember it. Book, yeah, which um, is you know, you know, it sources interviews with absolutely everybody, which incidentally they wouldn't let me listen to or look at because of you know. It was still classified, you know, 19 years later. But anyway, but I did the interviews myself. But I still would have liked to have, um, you know, had access to some of those, um, some of those audio recordings. But you know, somebody who was very close to the writing of that book um, said to me, or pointed out to me, that everybody in that book, apart from senior officers, has a pseudonym. Even people whose names are out there. Yep. Um, and certainly would have no problem uh, with being named in that book. Reason being, all the senior officers, their names are in there. And so they get the credit rather than, you know, some anonymous person, you know, who doesn't exist because it's not his name. Yeah, right? well, that's why there's only two people who are named in that in that 12 Strong movie um, under their actual names. And, you know, one of them was, as you say, not very beloved, uh, known to be an alcoholic and sent home for sexually assaulting a male Marine in the showers. So it's it, it, it's all gets to be uh, a lot of bullshit that was going on when they should have left the focus on the ODAs and let the teams do their job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's very much the, the view of the ODA. Um, but, you know, um, ODA 595 of you know, have really sort of told their story. And, um, uh, you know, I don't know why, you know, so th that pseudonym Mitch Nelson was used in 12 Strong. I don't know why it wasn't Mark Nooch. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they're actually increasingly sort of out there. And in fact, there's a, there's a book uh, I just saw today. I think it's due out in uh, May, May next year. Um, I forget the name. I forget the the name of it. But anyway, the but but Mark Nooch and Bob Pennington, and I think Jim DeFelice, oh good, uh, as a sort of writer, have have written their own good. account of ODA five nine five. Yeah, good. Yeah, for that. they're, good. they're getting the word out, and of course they're marketing the whiskey. In fact, there's some whiskey, horse soldiers whiskey behind me. So you know they are the horse soldiers. So they, you know, they prevailed in the end. Well, but, and it's it's funny. I I mean funny not like a you know anyway where when uh, Bowers comes in where Nooch had this like peer relationship with Dostom and and you know Bowers comes in and basically treats Dostom like a subordinate and imme and immediately like takes photos with them and sends a cable back hey rapport is made I know I know I mean that really there's a photo there's a photograph of um dostum with uh max bowers and bowers has his arm around him and dostum kind of look 
looks mystified to the nonplus, like what's going on here? Who is this guy? And then in the corner of the photo, you see Mark Nooch, who just looks pissed. Um, <laughs> and it just, it's kind of one of those pictures that just sort of speaks, uh, speaks volume. I mean, you know, <laughs> one of the things I try to do when I'm writing this sort of stuff is um, I don't want to be the person that's, you know, sitting in my armchair, you know, swinging a beer in 2021 saying, you know, this is how it should have been and you fucked up and you were a coward and if only you'd done this. Um, you know, everything there is difficult. Everybody who was there, you know, um, I think was there for good reasons. And there's an element of bravery in just sort of being in that profession and being in Afghanistan at that at that point. Um, but, uh, you know, having said that, all the uh, accounts of Bowers, um, very few of them are positive, uh, put it put it that way. And, and I think in particular, you know, the rapport with the G chief is, is key. And it's very, involves kind of a lot of sort of subtlety and yeah, coming in as the big man on campus and you work for me, I don't think they teach that at Robin Sage, Jack. I mean, you'd be able to no, correct no, me. No, not, I, don't, I don't recall that class. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. So can we, can we talk about the female pilot? Oh, yeah. So. Um, I'm going to need a refill for this. <laughs> Thanks, man. So, um, you know, as you know, in Afghanistan, I mean, Dostum actually, uh, Thank you. you know, when he was uh, in charge of Mazari, you know, of, in control of Mazari Sharif in the late 90s, you know, women went to university and, you know, he was a secular. I mean, he, he fought for the Russians, not because he was a communist, but more because he was a sort of a secularist and he hated the Pashtuns and, the, you know, Islamists. And um, so, but even, even for Dostum, you know, there are, I mean, you know, I, this time last year I was with him. I didn't see a, you know, I didn't see a woman during the entire time I was sort of within his orbit. It, you know, all of everything, the cooking, the serving, everything was was done by men. No women anywhere. And um, so, you know, there was a day when uh, Dostum just, Dave, David actually just been on that horse ride, I think, to Atta, and then had returned and he was, you know, he was dog tired. He was sort of snoozing in the, in the sort of mid morning and Dostum kicked him and Dostum was on the radio and Dostum would often, you know, it was kind of psychological warfare with the Taliban. He taught the Taliban, telling me he had the Americans there and he was, they were going to die and they needed to change sides and all that stuff. And Dostum, uh, kicked David and said, like, listen to this, listen to this, there's, listen to this pilot and he used this Afghan word, which was kind of like, you know, hermaphrodite or lady boy, you know, eunuch or something. And, you know, sort of a, a man with no balls or, you know, and David sort of listens and he's like, no, 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 that's, that's a woman. And, uh, Dostum was like a woman flying a plane. Actually, I think it was a navigator, <laughs> but you know, he, and he just sort of couldn't, believe it <laughs> and so again this sort of speaks to Dostum's kind of canniness in a way and sort of you know his sort of quick wittedness and his ability to sort of you know judge a situation but he sort of immediately had an idea and he was like oh okay okay so um you need to get this pilot David you need to get this pilot to say a poem you know I want I want her to recite a poem and and his idea was he was gonna he was gonna put the two receivers together so the Taliban commander who he was also talking to could hear this woman recite this stuff, and so so this F eighteen um, uh, or F fourteen I guess um, whatever it was anyway who which I will play what it was a navigator I think and was like you know I don't know any fucking poetry <laughs> there you know, once from, was a man from Nantucket <laughs> right I'm just. I'm like navigating a plane here and, um, 
uh, you know, I want to drop some bombs, just, you know. And so, so they was like, well, she doesn't know any poetry. He's like, what? <laughs> Who doesn't know any poetry? You know? <laughs> um, so I guess, I guess, you know, Dawson did know some poetry, like, you know, or at least expected people to like the suit. Um, so, so Davis, come on, like, there must be something. Um, so, um, what's it called? Is it the Navy fight song? I think it is. I think that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he gets her to recite this, sing this song, you know, I don't know the words. I was in the Royal Navy, not the, the, the U S Navy, but you know, sort of like, you know, go, go Navy, you know, kick army's ass or whatever it is. She recites a few lines of lines of the thing. Dawson puts the two receivers together and say, so, you know, and, and then sort of taunts the Taliban commander and, and says, uh, uh, you know, this is a, you know, this is an American woman, you know, who's come to kill you. And she's telling you that, you know, your dicks are small and you're, you know, get, you know, get, get fucked up the ass by you know, your cousin. And, you know, she's kind of demeaning them and just like, uh, taunting them. And so, you know, I guess psychological operations and, um, you know, and, and Dustin never got over the idea that, you know, that, the Americans had women in the skies who could kill the Taliban. You know, he thought this was great. Yeah. So for people who might not know, like in Afghanistan and places like that, you know, they just buy off the shelf ICOM radios or whatever. They have preset frequencies. They don't have crypto. They don't have, you know, any kind of security. So basically, if you know what channel your enemy is operating on, you can listen to them, you can talk to them. And so they would talk shit to each other all day and <laughs> taunt each other. Yeah. And so... Yeah. And the local Taliban and the local, um, you know, Northern Alliance, they kind of knew each other and they may have fought on the same side at, at times and they may be about to fight on the same side. Right. And, um, yeah, so they sort of knew the personalities and, um, yeah, so they could talk, you know, talk shit to each other, talk smack. So before we get to November 25th, the, the last thing I kind of want that really, I mean, a lot struck me, but the last thing that really struck me was uh, Glenn was the medic. Yes. So can you tell, uh, like, his frustration with the medical equipment and then the advice that he needed on the battlefield? So Glenn's a great guy. So Glenn was the medic on Team Bravo, and uh, he's still serving in the CIA. Um, he actually told me the other day that, his um, cover's been lifted. I'm not going to. I'm not going to use his last name just in case. But he said his cover's now been lifted. I think he's probably about to to leave. And um, you know, he was uh, special forces uh, reservist who joined the agency uh, as a physician's assistant, and uh, and has worked for the CIA's Office of Medical Service for the last 25 years or so. And uh, Glenn ended up being part of the 15-man rescue team on November the 25th. And so he saw some very uh, intense combat and I think was pretty, you know, deeply affected by it. And, you know, one of the great things about talking to these uh, CIA guys and Green Berets on the ground is that like, everyone will tell, you know, tell it how, how they see it. And, and Glenn in particular, who never holds back, <laughs> and um, actually, he, my first interview with him was actually in my house because I, you know, I live pretty close to CIA headquarters and it's during COVID and you couldn't go in. And um, there was uh, Glenn and a guy called Greg, who was a former SEAL, uh, who was also on Team Bravo. And so the interview was in my house, but the CIA, because they were still serving, the CIA public affairs officer came in and... Um, Glenn was effing and blinding and telling all these off-color stories. <laughs> and and it was Sarah from the CIA. She was great. She didn't bat an eyelid. And uh, and Glenn was like, and the fucking agency did this. And Jesus, this fucking idiots in headquarters had no clue. And, and, and anyway, Sarah was just like, whatever, you know, it's cool. Anyway, it was very, it was very funny. But, um, but Glenn... Um, so he was the medic on Team Bravo. So the 
three members of Team Bravo, but Scott from Team Alpha was uh, who'd gone over with this, you know, sub unit had gone over to um, Command Bravo with Atta. So they they rode with Atta to Mazari Sharif, and um, you know, this was. I mean, Glenn describes it as like Civil War style medicine. So he he'd you know he's still pissed about it. He felt that he'd gone in with insufficient surgical equipment. He wanted to have more kit. And um, he ended up having to perform field amputations on Afghans who'd um, either been sort of wounded in action or stepped on like toe popper mines and had their feet blown off and stuff. And um, he conducted, I think, three amputations uh, with uh, a Shrade multi-tool, which is like a leather man, you know, with like a saw on it. And oh actually God. his Shrade multi-tool is in the CIA museum. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's this Afghan who, you know, had his, most of his foot blown off and Glenn needed to amputate the rest of it and kind of tidy it all up. And, uh, and he'd never done it before. So he's like, you know, I need some help here. And so he, he calls CIA headquarters and says, you know, I need to do this. I, you know, can somebody, you know, it's like the guy who the you know, pilots had a heart attack and you're at the controls right? and you know, you've only <laughs> ever flown a Cessna and you need somebody to say, you know, how you land the thing. And so um, in CIA headquarters, they're like, okay, you know, stand by, we'll call you, you know, we'll call you back in 10 minutes. And 10 minutes later, the, sat phone rings and uh it's an army doctor in landstuhl surgeon um and glenn's like you know he's on the phone and, and um actually scott who was there told told me about this and um that he's just listening to glenn's going uh-huh okay uh-huh yeah okay all right okay uh-huh got it and then he puts the phone down and then he gets his he gets the saw you know thing on his multi-tool and freaking saws the guy's um foot off and sews it all up and it's like okay good to go <laughs> and he did that several times oh my god and uh you know it's kind of incredible and i mean glenn described the scene he said there was <laughs> there was a guy you know there was an afghan with a stick who was there which was to beat off the dogs who would stray dogs who'd come in and um, eat the bits of foot that had sort of dropped onto the ground. And they had a, like a light bulb, one light bulb from a generator. There was no stretcher, so the guy was lying on a ladder with a bit of carpet over it, you know, dirt everywhere. And, you know, Glenn was just like, you know, Civil War medicine. That's so they amazing. Did it. I mean, it's just incredible. And then he does this over the phone. He's like, yeah, I got to amputate this foot, and I'm not quite sure how to do it. So can you walk me through it? I know. I know. I know. Incredible. But, you know, it's sort of emblematic of this time where, you know, you just do what you've got to do. Right. You, you don't you don't have all the right bits of kit. Uh, there, there are no other options. And so you just you just improvise and, you know, and move on. Yeah. It, 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 there are so many good stories in this book. I mean, so I just yeah, so many good stories. Can you take us to November 25th and, and kind of work up to it and tell us what happened? Sure. So, so Mazari Sharif falls on November, November 9th. Um, and then the Americans go in uh, November the 10th. And they initially they go into Kalajangi, which is a big um, 19th century fort built of sort of, you know, mud and wood um and it's like something out of the arabian nights and you know i was i was there last year Incre incredible place um and you know it's a logical place to move into because it previously been dostum's headquarters the taliban had just fled left sort of shit and blood and god knows what everywhere like some of the rooms have been used to torture people and they trashed it on the way out but dostum had been there uh the russians had been there and, you know, it, it was sort of the main, you know, obviously it was secure, it was, had these, you know, 10 foot thick walls. 
so the Americans move in, um, but it's outside the city. Um, it's uh, the you know the shit and the dirty water. Everyone's you know um, you know coming down with um, you know diarrhea and vomiting and all that stuff. Um, and you know it was outside the city, um, and the accommodation wasn't great. And so um, around uh, November the twentieth, there's a decision to move uh into the city and there's a building called like a five-story building the turkish school uh which was you know uh it had an outer perimeter wall and it kind of made much more sense there was you know running water and showers and stuff and you could set up a kitchen there um and so they move so they move in but so but the americans had lived in this kalajangi for you know a few days and uh the taliban left a lot of weapons behind um like going back to 19th century all sorts of stuff you know russian stuff um and it was um stored in containers these shipping containers which are sort of ubiquitous in afghanistan you know and they used to transport prisoners to house prisoners to store weapons for all you know they become houses all sorts of things to eliminate um, prisoners well that as well <laughs> yes i mean yes i mean I mean, Dostum was accused of it. And in fact, Dostum admitted to me that one of his men did, you know, uh, you know, fire on a container and killed a bunch of prisoners in, inside it. But, you know, there are stories stretching back of the Taliban, you know, dropping uh, containers full of people into the Amu Darya River and, you know, containers being left in the desert for people to sort of just bait to death. Um, but anyway, during that period when they were in Kalajak, somebody, you know, flicked a cigarette end in a container or something and <laughs> it just complete went Jesus off and there's video of this of this you know ordinance just going off and and actually alex um you know, mike span was um kind of goofing around and you know jumping in front of the fireworks display for somebody to take a photo and alex sort of came in and was like what the fuck are you doing you know um and actually david videoed it and it's just like oh just another day in afghanistan you know um but uh you know it was fortuitous that they did spend that time in 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 kalajangi because you know mark mitchell who's from the odc he was the um he was the ops officer so the number three in the battalion element he ended up leading the rescue force on november the 25th and the reason why he went in was because he'd lived in kalajangi and kind of knew knew the layout um so they move into the turkish school and you know things are kind of changing you know imperceptibly so mazari sharif has fallen but there's a sense from the cia who are going around you know uh looking at, at prisoners and you know questioning prisoners working out if any of them are al-qaeda and uh you know also trying to get a handle on where the taliban have gone to because in classic fashion most of them are just melted away just put down their guns and gone home and so the mm -hmm. pashtun villages in the area and they're just trying to you know work out what's going on and there's sort of a sense i mean david has talked to me about this about how even then you know the taliban are kind of creeping back you know the villages on november the 12th which were fine to go to by november the 22nd they weren't fine that's mm -hmm. what dostum's people were saying you also had kind of a lot of tension between atta and Dostum in particular, because they're essentially fighting for control of, of Masri Sharif. Mm. So it's a kind of ambiguous situation. But at the same time, Task Force Daggers flying in, you know, quite a lot of new elements. Admiral Callan's in there, apparently, you know, with his Master Chief carrying his starch uniform in sort of plastic covering. Um, and, you know, a lot of support guys. There's, DIA linguists coming in and and you know actually Mitchell was you know what was like who the fuck are all these tourists you know because these are people that you know don't seem to have a, a military role per se but you know they require you know they have to be met at the landing strip and they have to be housed and fed and they take they take up time um but there's this um feeling that uh, you know i guess in washington 
uh, that uh, you know conflict is over, uh, combat is over in Masri Sharif. The battle is in Kunduz. The, co- the last stand for the Taliban in the north is in is in Kunduz. That's where the main effort is. And um, so, you know, November, the, you know, first forward to November the twenty fourth, two thousand and one. Team Alpha is split, so you have uh, three or four of them down in Kayan, Poly Khomri, sort of south of Mazari Sharif, um, or southeast of Mazari Sharif. So they were there to deal with sort of local warlords and try and persuade them to cut off uh, the retreat route from Kunduz for the for the Taliban, um, and then. Uh, JR and Scott were heading to uh, Kunduz with ODA 595. And so you had kind of like a, you know, a skeleton crew back in the, in the Turkish school. You also had Admiral Calland was there. So Admiral Calland um, on November the 25th was visiting a hospital with the guard, his guard force being four members of the SBS, British Special Forces who were there. Now, the SBS are in Masri Sharif uh, because Tony Blair, Tony Blair's government has decided that although they want to be shoulder to shoulder with the Americans, they don't want to be involved in a bloodbath. Uh-huh. So they've, they've uh, instituted a national caveat or the, you know, the rules of engagement, which are you can fire, but only when fired upon, which wasn't a whole lot of use at the time. Right. in northern Afghanistan and the SBS are pissed and the Americans are kind of like, well, okay, you know. Um, anyway, that's why they were in Masri Sharif. But November the 24th, the evening, well, the morning of November, November the 24th, 400 Al-Qaeda turn up to surrender uh, on the eastern edge of, of Masri Sharif. Now, there had been a, a murky uh, surrender agreement sort of brokered between Dostum and Mullah Fazl, who was a Taliban commander in the north. Uh, Americans had sort of stepped to one side, um, but the surrender was supposed to take place in Kunduz. But all of a sudden, these these 400, and they were Al-Qaeda, not Taliban, they were all foreign, they were all foreign fighters. No mm-hmm. Afghans amongst them, a few Pakistanis, but they were basically like the Ansar, you know, Brigade 055 yeah. guys. No, fighters rather than like sort of al-qaeda you know international terrorists but al-qaeda nonetheless um and so they turned up at the morning of the 24th to surrender and so the whole day on the 24th this takes everybody by surprise um and there's a whole day of like working out what the hell's going on and then at dusk you know they this you know the surrender is kind of finally agreed. Dostum's guys are shit scared of these Al Qaeda fighters, Arabs, you know, who have a sort of like boogeyman kind of reputation, and that, that you know you can never kill them, and they'll you know, you know they'll you know fight to the death and slit your throat and all that. So, so they're not really keen on searching them. Also, there's an Afghan kind of tradition of honor, and you know when you surrender. Um, you just change sides or go home. You, you're not disarmed and imprisoned. And so the decision is taken that these 400 Al-Qaeda prisoners, one of whom is John Walker, turns out to be John Walker Lind. Who, who was know. released in 2019. Right. And is you know, now writing articles for The Intercept. And of course. He's appearing, would- he's appearing at some conference in london tomorrow i don't think i think it's going to be remote or an audio message or something but he's yeah full-on sort of isis essentially propagandist yeah wasn't he whining about like how much we bombed them or something like that it's like how much we bombed isis yeah like yeah you can shut the fuck up pal thanks yeah um so these guys so these 400 al-qaeda are moved to kalajangi um around about dusk uh, and actually, Justin Sapp from Team Alpha, Mike Spann, and David Tyson go to the fort on the evening of November the 24th. And, you know, just as they're getting there, uh, an explosion, uh, suicide grenade goes off, and one of the Al-Qaeda guys kills himself and takes out two of Dostum's 
uh, commanders. And so it's pretty chaotic. Actually, there's a journalist, British journalist, who gets a bit of shrapnel. It's very chaotic. And some of this is on is on film, which is sort of fascinating. Also, there's this kind of sense of, in fact, there was a there was a Pakistani prisoner who was being interviewed that evening. Who was like, "We are not surrendered," you know. What? So some of these prisoners don't think they surrendered. They think they're getting safe passage uh, to either to Herat or down to Kandahar. So it's very kind of you know chaotic and and weird. This grenade goes off, and so Dostum's guys are like, "Okay, we need to get the just get these guys into the." Uh, into the cellar of the pink house so the pink house is this soviet built building i think it was built sort of as a schoolhouse uh in the 70s um or 80s i guess probably um in the in the this is sort of center of the southern half of the fort like the fort is divided by a, a divided between north and south by this wall uh, with with a gate in the middle and um so all these prisoners are sort of crammed crammed into this cellar and uh you know D justin you know was, i remember him saying to me that you know they were everybody was really amped up it looked like something really bad could happen and in fact if there'd been an uprising at that point you know that probably would have been a more opportune time for that al-qaeda guys to do it. it would have killed a lot more um it probably would have killed a bunch of journalists and probably the three cia guys and stuff um but anyway the three CIA guys go back to the schoolhouse, Turkish school for the night. Uh, that night in the in the cellar, there are explosions, uh, and some of the Al Qaeda prisoners are killed. Because there are, you know, clearly there's some kind of dispute going on about what to do. And um, the next morning, uh, David. Tyson and Mike Spann arrive in the force about 8 a.m. And, you know, of course, the nature of something that goes wrong is that, you know, for years afterwards, you know, it's being litigated and every sort of decision is, is being questioned. And so, you know, it's often said that, um, you know, they went in without security. They didn't know what they were doing. They were too casual. What were they thinking? Why were they questioning these prisoners out in the open with, with you know, um, no sort of, you know, Green Berets uh, helping them? Um, but, you know, I mean, I've talked to all of them, everybody involved about this. And so there's kind of a few elements. One element that I discovered uh pretty late on in the research was that task force dagger had sent a directive to the green berets to say because of the suicide attack no green berets were to go into the the fort the next day cia didn't know this um but they didn't they were content to go in anyway because they had afghan allies and they'd been working with these afghans every day for the previous 40 days and they trusted them and you know there was only eight in team alpha you know in you know half of covering sort of half of northern afghanistan and they didn't feel they needed green berets oda 595 who were in kunduz you know, say that if they'd been there they would have gone in and i believe actually that the relationship between the oda mark nutri's oda and um team alpha was so close that actually that would have happened whatever the directive from task force uh -huh. dagger that that, that that nooch and his guys would have said like fuck off we're coming with you yeah i know you don't want us but you know we're we're coming with you three of our guys will go in i mean after all that morning four sbs were with guarding admiral calland going to visit the hospital uh -huh. so anyway also justin sat was supposed to go in with them but justin was told he needed to deliver a vehicle um down to poly Cymru. and so you know often i think when sort of catastrophic things happen you you look back and mm -hmm. it's kind of like 12 things all came together and if you changed any one of those things it wouldn't have happened and then you know if you think about it by extension there would have been other days when 11 of the elements were present but not the 12th and it was okay and we don't we don't think about it but you know if justin had gone in with them that day everything could have been different 
but Justin wasn't there. And it was David and Mike and, you know, the, the kind of tenor of the times was that, you know, this was Al Qaeda. This was the first time Americans had been able to interrogate face to face Al Qaeda since 9-11, mm -hmm. but 400 of them. Uh, we didn't know what was going on. And it was kind of a, a national imperative, you know. And we couldn't, you know, the sense was we couldn't wait a day or two, uh, couldn't wait for perfect um, circumstances. We just need to get in. And, you know, these conversations were had between Mike Spann um, and David Tyson and Hank Crompton the night before. Um, you know, at the same time, I think people's personalities come into this. I mean, Mike, Mike Spann was, was determined to get to the enemy and to sort of make a difference. David had less military experience than the other seven in Team Alpha and was perhaps more in, more comfortable with the Afghans and less kind of suspicious than some other members of Team Alpha. And so I do think it's very possible if JR or Alex had been in Mazari Sharif that day, it might not, it wouldn't have gone down the same way mm -hmm. because they would have had different kind of concerns. And that's just sort of the nature of life. But um, it was those two that went in and um you know there a lot of this is on video so david shot some video and also dostum had an intelligence guy um who shot video right up until the point of the uprising and so mike and david along with um syed carmel who was uh the sort of mazari sharif intelligence chief for dostum aman Allah, who was the intelligence chief from the from the darius valley um and their various guys um, took out, brought out the prisoners in ones and twos from, from the cellar and lined them up in the courtyard in the sunlight. It was November 25th, but it was a pretty sunny day. Um, and it's sort of every nationality you could imagine, you know, uh, lots of Arabs, few Pakistanis, uh, Uyghurs, uh, Africans, um, uh, guys Dagestanis Chechens like you know David said to me it was like the smorgasbord of Al-Qaeda you know yeah and for him kind of incredibly exciting like like you know sort of the pinnacle of his life and career that he can use all his languages for something that's sort of incredibly important and I think for Mike as 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 well you know he's face to face with Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. guys who attacked America on on 9-11 um and so you know but David was sort of, you know, over the course of that morning, began to realize that this was just sort of overwhelming. Mm. It was not the, these were not interrogation conditions uh, because they could all hear each other and it was just right. too sort of chaotic and they couldn't be separated. Um, and, and so you could kind of get a sense of, of who they were, but it was pretty hard to, you know, identify who was a commander and who was a really serious guy and who was just a sort of, you know, jihad tourist or, or whatever term you, you want to use. Um, it also became clear during the course of that morning that these guys had not been disarmed. And so as they were coming up out of the cellar, you know, they had, you know, AKs, grenades, you know, freaking machine guns, uh, all sorts of stuff. And there was a big pile of weapons inside the pink house, which every so often would be uh, cleared and then that these weapons would be put in a container. But at one point, David went into the pink house and, and Amanla said to him, it's, it's, you can't be in here. It's, it's, it's too dangerous. Um, and so they're questioning these prisoners. Mike uh, focused quite intently on John Walker Lind, who had told, he he'd been directed to tell fellow Al-Qaeda and Taliban fighters that he was Irish and he did have an Irish grandmother, uh, but to not say that he was an American. And so there was an Iraqi prisoner that had told David and Mike that there's an Irishman over there. So Mike was particularly, didn't speak languages. He was particularly focused on English speaking prisoners. And so he singled out Lind and was like, you know, who are you? You know, I know you speak English, talk to me, you know, what are you here for? You know, do you believe in this? You know, Muslims were killed on 9-11. Is this what, you know, is this is this what you believe in? And Lynn just doesn't say anything. Just 
his head's just kind of bowed, doesn't say a word, um, which was unusual on that day because most, almost all of these guys were speaking. It may have been bullshit or, you know, claims they were, you know, there's one guy from Qatar who was like, oh, I'm a Mossad agent. I'm in the CIA too. I work for Al Jazeera. So there's all this stuff going on. Uh, some of them are admitting, uh, you know, yeah, I'm here for jihad. You know, I, tra <laughs> I trained in toxins at the Al Farouk camp. Mm -hmm. um, but Lynn says nothing. Um, and of course, the family, I think, with, you know, some considerable justification sort of say, you know, he was in that cellar that night and, you know, he uh, understood Arabic and he would have heard the debates and he would have had a, had a, had some inkling that was that there was an uprising planned mm. and you know we now know um from you know prisoner accounts and intelligence and you know putting all the pieces together this was basically a trojan horse mm. plot by mullah fazl pretty clever one to um re, you know get control of the fort and retake masri sharif and when the uprising happened there were um taliban elements moving from kunduz and from Balkh to the northwest of Masri Sharif, sort of converging on on the city, but but you know they weren't able to coordinate it properly. But anyway, you know, at, at about eleven a.m., David is, um, uh, you know, I've talked to him about this because on the on the video um, he just doesn't sound like himself. His voice is very strained. He's swearing a lot more than he he you know, he swears like we all do, but um, but you know more than normal. Uh, he's very very kind of rough, you know, intense. Um, and he was the he was the bad cop, and Mike was the good cop in this sort of interrogation scenario. But um, I mentioned this to him, and he said, "Yeah, my wife said that." He said, it "Just doesn't sound like you." Um, and so you know what I think was happening was that he had a sort of physiological reaction to the danger, mm -hmm. but his brain hadn't yet processed it, but his mm -hmm. body was telling him, this is fucked up. You know, you need to get out. It's, it's dangerous, but his brain hadn't quite caught up. Um, and you know, at 11 AM, David was just sort of thinking, you know, we need to wrap this up. There's, you know, a dozen, 18 or so prisoners still in the cellar. Syed Carmel was telling him that, you know, these are hardcore guys who are left, commanders, probably Uzbeks, um, and, you know, and sort of at that moment, David was about 50 yards from the pink house. Uh, Mike was much closer with, uh, there were two doctors, some Afghan medics who were tending to the wounded. And Mike had, you know, seen on video, it's eerie, you see him walking over, uh, to talk to some English speaking prisoners there. And at that moment, uh, this is the video, Dostum's intelligence guy, the video stops at this point. Um, but there's uh, the sound of like shouting and an explosion and some gunshots uh, within, within the pink house. And basically a group of prisoners uh, had, had come up the stairs and overwhelmed the guards, killed Amanullah killed the other guards, uh, grabbed their weapons. And, you know, in terms of the uprising, it's kind of like game on. Mm -hmm. And there's this sort of moment where, you know, again, sort of maybe, you know, a slight sort of foretelling of the future. I think there were enough Afghan guards, enough Northern Ireland guards to deal with the situation. But, you know, it wasn't Dostum's A team, or maybe even it's sort of the C team, you know, the weak and the lame who'd been left behind while the main effort was in Kunduz. Mm. And they were either killed or they ran. A lot of them ran. Mm. And um, so Mike had uh, an AKMS on his back. So Team Alpha had gone in with AKM, East German AKMSs and uh, Glock 17s. Um, and actually, David was the only one. He didn't have a Kalashnikov and he had. Um, a Browning high power and he only had a he only had his Browning with him that day but Mike had his AKMS sort of wheeled around uh shot two or three of the prisoners who were rushing towards him but at the same time the prisoners who'd been lined up 
in the outside the pink house. So they've been loosely tied with their turbans, like kind of chicken wing. So it's like on the upper arm, but they you know, their feet hadn't been bound. So they, they jumped up and sort of jumped on him from behind. And so he, he pulled out his pistol, shot a couple more of them, um, but was just sort of overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. David sort of heard the commotion and he described to me um, how, you know, time slowed down, tunnel vision, loss of hearing, like classic sort of stress reaction. And he's just like, what the fuck's going on? Mm -hmm. um, and so again, his sort of, his brain kind of taking time to sort of catch up and he sees a guy um, an Arab prisoner running towards him who's got a macro pistol in his hand uh, but he's sort of firing sideways like kind of like gangster style or whatever it is and David's like what the fuck is he doing you know mm. and and then he can see the rounds being ejected uh, from the pistol and he's like he's fucking shooting he's shooting at me mm. and he's and then David's like kill the motherfucker and so he, he he kills him he shoots him twice at the same time he hears mike shouting like dave 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 and so david you know he describes this as you know he had no choice it was muscle memory and all the rest of it but you know i've thought about this a lot and i've talked to him about it a lot it's sort of an incredible thing really the, to you know for anybody to run towards danger in a situation like that I mean, he could have frozen, he could have run the other way. I mean, there are lots of Afghans running the other way. Um, and so to my sort of theory on this is it's kind of like the core, you know, these incredibly stressful situations. It's kind of like the core of your character, of who you are, sort of comes to the fore. And so for David, he just ran towards Mike. Uh, gets there and, you know, there's these four guys on top of him. David shoots them, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. So he shoots, shoots each, each of them twice, but kind of back and forth. And then he kicks Mike. Mike's on the bottom. He kicks Mike. No movement, no sign of life. There's blood on the ground. And at that point, you know, David grabs Mike's AKMS and he's, he's now in this situation of kill or be killed, you know. Uh -huh. Uh, he's got guys headbutting him, flinging themselves at him. Guys come, and he's just killing them. You know, he's just uh, some of them are still tied up. Uh, and you know, there was an Indonesian guy who was just headbutting him in the back, and he just turns around and you know, blows his head off, basically blows his brains out. And um, and so, you know, this I think it was about eleven minutes or so where. David knows that the, you know, the best chance of safety is get to the northern end of the, of the fort. Certainly get out of the southern compound, and he just shoots his way out. I mean, at one point, you know, there's, there's you know, he describes it, it's almost comical where there's a guy shooting at him and he's shooting, you know, for, popping out from behind a tree like kind of a western. They're miss, missing each other. Um, at one point, there was a, there was. Uh, you know, an Al Qaeda prisoner who's got one of the Uzbek guards um, kind of in a headlock with a grenade and he's pulled the pin and he, and the guard is kind of gesturing to David, like, if you shoot me, then that means I'm going to blow myself up. I'm going to kill the prisoner and me and you. And so David kind of moves on. And then Syed Carmel, the intelligence chief, comes up from behind David, shoots, shoots the prisoner who then grenade explodes, kills the guard. Uh, so just, you know, there's RPGs because the the prisoners have now got the weapons. They've gone to the containers. They've got all sorts of weapons. Um, pandemonium. Yeah. I mean, just, just incredible. And David is still, you know, he still wants to reconstruct the whole thing, but he can only kind of get to about, you know, two or three of these 11 minutes. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know he gets to the he gets to the northern end of the the fort. He bursts you know he bursts through the door and then 
there's a German TV crew, there's a German TV crew there. <laughs> and there's this sort of surreal bit of footage where, you know, that Arnhem Stout, who I interviewed, um, who's the German TV reporter, is questioning this CIA officer who's just run in about what the hell's going on. He, Arnhem's pretty scared. Um, and David is just like, you know, wide eyed. Yeah, in, it's I'm, I'm sure that like in his mind, it's still surreal. Like the reality of the situation, yeah. it, it has a hard time. Sometimes it's, you, your brain has a hard time like catching up to what the actual reality is. Yeah. And so David is, you know, Dave, Arnhem's asking some, you know, some good questions like what's going on and who are you and what's happened. And and then also some kind of goofy questions like, you know, so you were trying to infiltrate them. And David, David's sort of, you know, he's answering him and he's trying to be kind of cool mm -hmm. or evasive. He's sort of saying what was, you know, so at one point he says, oh, it was me and some other guy. Mm -hmm. And you know, David's like, what the fuck was I thinking? You know, I should, first of all, I shouldn't have just said anything. And, you know, who, you know, but I'm trying to sort of, you know, I realize my cover's blown. Uh, you know, I realize this is, you know, I'm on camera, but, you know, I'm, so I'm just saying this goofy shit. Yeah. Um, and then, and then for the next five hours, they're holed up in, in, in that headquarters building. David gets a phone from Arnhem and he could, he, you know, the only he's lost his notebook. Um, the only number he could remember was that like the embassy and his house. So he phones his house in Tashkent. His wife answers the phone is like, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, because it was, you know, Thanksgiving a couple of days earlier. And David's like, listen, this, you know, this is serious. And she drops the phone, picks it up, you know, he, and David's like, you need to call Charlie. You know, I mean, Kala Jangi, she writes it down like Kuala Jangi. She's never heard the name of the fort before. Um, but she realizes that, you know, this is really bad. She can hear the gunfire in the background. David speaks to the embassy um the, the air force uh defense liaison guy um and you know david says you know this is where i am you know we need help but don't you know, he's really scared of airstrikes you know because you know he he doesn't want to get you know he doesn't want an airstrike on the headquarters building and, and get killed but you know in the meantime back at the turkish school the alarms raised the, there's a rescue team put together led by mark mitchell green beret major from ODC 53, there's eight SBS guys. There's a couple of DIA linguists in there. Glenn, the Team Bravo medic, it, it, um, is in there. Uh, and uh, they drive off to the they drive off to the fort, not knowing what they're going to find. And then there's, um, you know, oh, there's a SEAL called Steph Bass who. Uh, received the Navy Cross for his actions on November 25th, who's part of the SBS team, who's um, on an exchange, in an exchange billet with the SBS. Uh, he's there. And, um, you know, David is on top of the headquarters building, picking off Al-Qaeda fighters who are coming through the central gateway. Um, he's being blown off his feet by JDAMs being, um, being dropped. Um, and... Uh, you know, there's this sort of desperate kind of, you know, attempt to uh, get him out. Um, eventually, um, uh, Steph Bass and Tony, who was uh, an SBS corporal, um, uh, they kind of start to go forward. Uh, Steph leaves Tony behind um, and goes to the tower on the west and sort of, this is at dusk and peers out and um sees a prone body um wearing blue jeans and a black fleece which was what mike span was was wearing um and the dead afghans there he's picking off kalashnikovs picking up Kalash kalashnikovs from dead afghans and he fires two shots either side of the the legs of the body to see if there's any flinching there's, there's no signs of life. And so he pretty much confirms that that's Mike Spann and, and, and Mike Spann is dead. David eventually escapes from the fort, um, just sort of slips over the wall. Um, <laughs> uh, commandeers a taxi at gunpoint with the German 
journalists all in tow and various sort of Afghans and goes back to uh, the Turkish school. Um, and, you know, in the meantime, the SBS have brought their GPMGs and killing, you know, large numbers of Al-Qaeda in, in, the, in the southern compound. And that's the start of a six-day battle. I mean, the next, the next morning, the American forces try and end the whole thing with a 2,000-pound JDAM which is dropped on a friendly position. It was pilot um, of the F-18, got the coordinates mixed up. Um, and so it, it, it drops on the, the northeast tower, flips over a T-55 tank um, that the Northern Alliance have, kills a bunch of Afghans, wounds five Americans, the first Purple Hearts of the Afghan war, and some SBS, no Americans or friend, you know, uh, Western friendlies killed. But that kind of ends it for that day. AC 130s come in that night. Um, pretty much ends the possibility of the Al Qaeda prisoners taking over the fort. But there's then this sort of like a pitch battle every day, and it's pretty much an Afghan show. Um, and uh, most of the, the remaining prisoners are holed up in the basement. Mike Spann's body uh, doesn't get, it takes three days for Mike Spann's body to be recovered. Um, and then it takes six days until, you know, the final, they flood the basement, the cellar of, of the pink house. Um, and 86 Al Qaeda guys emerge, you know, one of them, John, John Walker Lynn. Um, so, you know, it seemed like it was all over. And then this, crazy sort of you know six day battle ensues uh, i that's okay i mean i honestly have nothing but respect for david like i i i don't know if people are critical or what but but i can completely understand his sort of shell shock his sort of like yeah. the whole you know matching reality with you know like it's it, it, it's, yeah, it's, he's it's, in a battle haze after that. I mean, anyone would be. I, it's I, not easy. He's fighting no. against uh, against impossible odds at that point. And then and then you go from this surreal situation into this, you know, somebody's like sticking a microphone in your face <laughs> and asking you interview questions. I know. Like like I like he might question why he said stuff, but like it's totally normal. Like you're trying, your brain is like you have so many cross circuits at that point in time. Like, there is no normal right now, and, you know, I totally get it. Yeah. I mean, certainly been second-guessing over the years. I mean, yeah. um, and sort of in, in the immediate aftermath, because, sure. you know, you're the guy that survived, and the other guy sure. died. And, and you know, you, you're the guy, you're the only guy that can tell the tale. Although there were, you know, a number of sort of Afghans there as well, Um but yeah, I mean, David, I mean, one of the fantastic things about the research for this book and dealing with David has been, um, you know, the hours and hours of talking to him about how he processed this, what he's been through. And he's a very humble guy. You know, he's always saying, you know, I'm not a hero. I mean, he was awarded the Distinguished Intelligence Cross for the CIA, like the, you know, the highest, honor, you know, for valor, the highest award, you know, the CIA equivalent of, the Medal of Honor, I guess, and very, very few of those are awarded um, for his actions that day. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, he decided um, that, you know, it could either over, overwhelm him um, or he could kind of deal with it. But either way, it was going to sort of define the rest of his life. And so what he decided to do is essentially to sort of incorporate it into his sort of psyche. And I think he had no other option because you can't sort of shut this, no. this kind of stuff out. Right. And um, so he talk, you know, he talks about it. Um, you know, he kept scrapbooks of where he, little snippets of, you know, news and stuff, you know, like a dozen scrapbooks. Of, and it's, so he's literally trying to piece it together um, obviously, he had um, he was diagnosed with PTSD, and he um, he um, you know spoke to psychologists and therapists, and you know who who told him that you know you're you know part of his quest is to work out exactly what happened. 
you know, to try and get what he calls like God's video of what he, what happened and what he did that day. And the psychologist would say to him, it's just, yeah, it's been erased from the hard drive. You're never going to get there's it. There's no memory. Answers, memory really. doesn't work that way. I mean, if you talk to right. four guys after a firefight, they will all tell a different yeah, story. Even if you saw it on video, you would still have a hard time yeah, understanding why Memory just happened. doesn't right. work that way, you know? Um, and, Tob- and that's probably for the benefit of the human race that our memory doesn't work that Toby, way. Toby, a, yeah. uh, uh, a couple of viewer questions for you here. Um, and this is actually kind of going more towards the beginning of our interview here. Uh, in your opinion, are the troubles over or on hold in Ireland? <laughs> wow. So, I mean, I guess I... Tend to, so I'm not close to the events there, you know, sort of day to day or or week to week. Um, I think in the you know the recent events with Brexit, um, which have meant that you know Northern Ireland is uh, not in the European Union, but the Republic of Ireland is, has made the issue of the border, uh, you know, it's brought it made it front and center again, where it's sort of you know, British and Irish policy for the last 25 years is to sort of make it an invisible border and like make it sort of just, you know, exist in sort of name only. So, I mean, I've always believed that it'll probably only be over when there's a United Ireland um, and that the IRA, uh, while it will have, um, you know, have periods when it's active um, and, uh, you know, when it's uh, got a sort of full-scale campaign, there'll, there'll be other periods where it's sort of dormant, but it will always kind of come back. And that's what happened after, you know, the border campaign in the early 60s. Um, and then there was sort of, you know, the IRA sort of went away. And this old phrase of, I think it was like, um, the pike in the haystack, you know, the pike would just be sort of put in the haystack and brought out. So, um, you know, I'm the, not going to predict I, the core. Well, the core happens, issues I, have I'd not be been surprised resolved, right? Result. Yeah, exactly. yeah. This yeah. is probably true of any movement or you know ideological movement that that has offshoots. But but how does the main body of the IRA, you know, that that is that is working for peace or or working for whatever, how do they manage or how do they deal with the offshoots that might have, uh, you know, more focused hardline radical, whatever you want to call it. I don't want to like, but, but a different agenda. Well, it's like any movement. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know. Look at what the Taliban's got to deal with. You know, they're split. They've got ISIS-K, you know, so they're, they're trying to get some kind of international acceptance, but they're also looking at the sort of, you know, hardliners. Uh, now, that's not to say the Taliban aren't hardliners themselves. Are they, you know, sometimes use the hardliners so-called hardline is to sort of, you know, as leverage in negotiations. So it's very sort of complex. Um, but, you know, the history of the Re- Irish Republican movement has been splits and, and, and factions and offshoot groups. And, um, you know, the last 20 years or so, when you've had part of the Republican movement, um, you know, I don't believe they believe in peace. I believe they believe that they can achieve their aims through politics um, better than they better than armed conflict. So it's a sort of a tactical dispute rather than a kind of moral um, difference. Um, But yeah, I mean that this is the nature of uh, of politics and of a movement, you know, post conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next question here. Any observations from your interviews with military and, te- and intelligence services reflecting on their need for improving cultural competence versus the U.S. centric lens in current and future ops? Well, certainly, um, I think, uh, you know, there's a sense from CIA people in Team Alpha guys who, um, you know, certainly two of them, J.R. Seeger and, and David Tyson had a, you know, a great sort of cultural expertise. And, you know, David is, you know, was the only Uzbek speaker in the CIA at, at the time, which if you think about, um, 
you know the importance of Uzbekistan, the importance of you know Uzbek speaking Afghans was was pretty surprising, and so I think there is a belief um, that you know we need more linguists and we need more cultural expertise, and that we can't just export America around the world. But these things are sort of expensive and uh, yeah. difficult, and you have you know you have issues with you know security clearances. You know, I mean, this is kind of a joke, you know, which is based in some truth. Actually, there were no Mormons on team, team Alpha, but there are a lot of Mormons in the CIA because they can pass the polygraph because they yeah. speak one language because they did a mission. You know, they only drink coffee and don't have alcohol and they get married and have loads of kids and are very wholesome. So they're perfect. But are Mormons the guys who are going to go into, you know, and un understand Afghans necessarily? Um, and so... You know, you know if you, you know if you smoke pot when you were younger, or you you did a few bad things, or you broke the law occasionally, you know, and you lived sort of close to the edge. Maybe that's the kind of person, you know, we sh we should be recruiting for intelligence agencies rather than sort of the goody two shoes that can pass the polygraph the first time. <laughs> so you know, it's sort of an ongoing debate. Um, but I think the I think the answer is you know we can net you know we can never as a country have you know too many people that speak language. I say this as a person who doesn't speak any languages or you know a little bit of French, but hardly anything really. But essentially monolingual. We can never have enough, too many people who speak languages and have experience of different parts of the world. Uh, yeah. Ben asks, which area of Afghanistan, if any? Would be the most comparable to. I hope I'm saying it right. Uh, South Arma, the the area in, in Ireland that you studied. <laughs> um, well, I sort of hesitate the to make uh, the comparison, but you know, I guess you know South Arma be the most rebellious, least easy to to tame, uh, you know, place in Ireland, and so I guess the. I mean, you know, I spent quite a lot of time in Helmand, you know, in the Pashtun South, and. I don't think that's a place that is ever going to be pacified um, by uh, the British or the Americans. So I guess I would say, you know, uh, Helmand. On the other hand, one of the things about South Amar is, uh, you know, it's border with the Irish Republic. And so, you know, maybe like Kunar province, because, you know, you draw parallels between, you know, the you know, somewhat limited sanctuary the IRA had in the Irish Republic uh, to the Pakistan Pakistani sanctuary that the Taliban certainly have. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't draw these parallels yeah. too closely, really. They I, kind of get awkward. And, and I think that that's one of the things is that people, that are, like we talked about earlier, about the national identity of Afghanistan or or a cohesive, whether it's national or, or religious or whatever, but even if they share a religion in Afghanistan, there were like 14, 15 different ethnicities or 40 different languages. Yeah. And they, they not only do they identify that, but they group as that and they don't see themselves outside of that generally. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you look, so yeah, JR said to me, he doesn't believe that Afghanistan's a country, you know, it's a it's collection, not. collection of tribes and eth ethnicities. And, you know, the Pashtuns are the largest uh, ethnic group, but they're not the majority. You know, if you add up the Tajiks and the Hazaras and, and the Uzbeks, uh, then, you know, there's more of them than, than Pashtuns. And so, you know, I think one of the, you know, again, I hesitate to say that, you know, come up with sort of easy solutions or if only this had happened kind of, you know, pronouncements. But I do feel, you know, we, sh I mean, given that, you know, federalism and, you know, 50 states that maybe the United States could have understood this better, that rather than centralizing, um, we should have devolved, you know, but this got caught up in the warlords issue, you know, but really who better, you know, okay, so he's not a nice guy and he's not somebody that's going to sort of pass muster in the salons of Washington, but, you know, who's going to command respect and going to be able to get things done in Northern Afghanistan? Well, Dostum. Right. Is some Pashtun, is Hamid Karzai from Kabul? Well, no. 
So why did we opt for centralization? I don't understand it. Right, All right. right. Last question. Why did the Taliban accept John Walker Lind? <laughs> uh, I think they were pretty suspicious of him initially. Um, and he wasn't kind of, you know, a roughy toughy, you know, gun toting fighter type. I mean, he was a pretty um, kind of weedy um, character. But, you know, he learned, um, he memorized the Quran, mm -hmm. he, he learned Arabic, he was, he was there. Um, I think, uh, I mean, he was, so the interplay with John Walker in between the Taliban and Al Qaeda is interesting, because uh, he was sent by the Taliban to Al Qaeda to the Al Farouk camp, which was and he was with the Ansar Brigade, the helpers uh, with the Arabs. And he was asked at Al Farouk camp whether he wanted to carry out foreign operations. So basically, you know, suicide bombings against, you know, Israel, uh, European targets, the United States. And he said, No, I want to fight in Afghanistan. Um, but I'm sure that there was a sense that um, this American could be used against the West somehow. You know, the Taliban's an Afghan group, but, you know, it had this, and still does, this very close relationship with, with Al-Qaeda, whereas, you know, you know, we'll help you, you'll help us, and, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, um, you know, uh, live or die together. And so I think had... Uh, John Walker Lind survived uh, and, you know, not being captured, uh, then, you know, he's a pretty committed guy. You know, he's, mm -hmm. he was supporting ISIS, uh, you know, in handwritten letters uh, a few years ago at a time when ISIS was beheading Americans. So his, I think his ideological commitment has never wavered throughout the last 20 years. So, um I mean, if you're the Taliban, uh, you're very close to Al-Qaeda, a guy like that could be useful. Sure. I mean, even now, as Yahya Lind, he's a writer, translator, and former prisoner of war. <laughs> right. I know. Right. Prisoner of war. Yeah. So, yeah. Very, very nice description. Folks, uh, everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. I think this interview with Toby has been amazing, and I'd love to have you some back uh, Toby, back again sometime yeah, to talk about we, your other works, yeah, actually. absolutely, man. Um. Please, please uh, like and subscribe to the channel. Go and check down in the uh, in the links in the description to uh, join our Patreon if you want to support the channel. There's some merch also if you want to get Team House coffee mugs and all that good stuff. Check and, us out on Instagram. We're going to do a giveaway soon. Yeah, and uh, also uh, next week, next Friday, we're going to have Caroline Walsh on the show. She is the author of Fairly Smooth Operator. She was a coastie. And she was a CIA analyst. So we're looking forward to talking to her next week. And, Toby, where can people find you? Show off the book. Show off the goods here. Where can people find the book, Toby? Show the book as well here. Um, I'm trying to be very easy to find. Um, so tobyharnden.com, H-A-R-N-D-E-N, uh, is the website. At, uh, at Toby Harnden is Twitter. And just to be different, uh, Toby Harnden one on Instagram, the number one, um, or You're just the, Google me. And the first, so, I don't know, whatever the phrase is, wherever wherever books are sold. El Primo, <laughs> Toby Harnden one, and at uh, Toby or Tobyharnden dot com. Toby, I, I know I've eaten up like three hours of your time. Can I ask you to stay for a, a, the bonus segment after for just a moment? Sure. All right. Um, so that's the show. We'll see you guys next Friday. Thank you, everyone.